Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is consideration of business motion 15121 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a timetable for the stage three consideration of the inquiries into fatal accidents and sudden deaths etc. Scotland Bill. Could I ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press their request to speak button now? And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion, please. Moved. Thank you. So no member is asked to speak against the motion and I will now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 15121 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is a statement by Richard Lockhead on an update on common agricultural policy payments. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of the statement and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Richard Lockhead, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, sorry. Yes, Cabinet Secretary, 10 minutes, please, for this statement. I'm pleased to update Parliament on our progress towards making the 2015 payments under Pillar 1 of the new Common Agricultural Policy. However, before I do, I want to touch briefly on two immediate issues affecting our farmers in Scotland. Firstly, of course, is the Fourth Road Bridge closure, which is having an impact on some farmers and on the wider food and drink sector. The government is quick uh, to contact the animal feed sector and the whisky sectors and other relevant sectors. And as members are aware, we secured an immediate relaxation of driver's hours, which has been helpful to these sectors. We've also been working with the industry to help improve contingency planning as well. And we understand, for instance, that some livestock units only get feed deliveries once stocks get low, with no contingency being in place. Clearly, that's too risky, so we've been working with stakeholders to help ensure they're better prepared. We'll keep in touch with the industry to monitor the impact of the situation and, of course, we'll seek to resolve any problems that arise as quickly as possible. The second immediate issue is the flooding that has uh, followed Storm Desmond over last weekend. Naturally, the government's immediate focus was on families and businesses who were flooded out. My colleague Eileen McLeod had a, an intense focus on these issues. But we must also be conscious of any impact on our farming sector. I have now had a full update from our agricultural offices who have told me that the impact so far on the sector has fortunately been minimal, but clearly I will pay ongoing attention to that. But indeed that situation has been confirmed by NFU Scotland as well. As well as those challenges, our farmers and crofters have also been facing unfavourable market conditions, which we are all familiar with, and an unhelpful exchange rate through 2015 as well. So this has certainly been a challenging year for all our farmers and crofters which is why we've known for some time how important it was to get the new cap implemented as quickly as possible. We're talking about over £400 million in new basic and greening payments, £45 million in couple support schemes for beef and £8 million for sheep, and later on over £60 million will be issued uh, through LFAS payments. So that is substantial support for the sector. But we also knew getting that cash out the door was going to be an unprecedented task for the government. This is the biggest cap reform for a generation. It's the first time ever that Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 have been reformed in the same year. In 2015, we'll have, we'll have launched nearly 20 schemes, 20 schemes across both pillars. Nearly all of those schemes are either brand new or significantly changed from the old cap. In Pillar 1 in particular, the changes are enormous. Some of those changes were imposed on us by Europe, like greening, which is a, proving to be a major challenge for all member states. There are also things we successfully negotiated with Europe, such as the Scottish Clause, to tackle what is known as slipper farming and to bring fair treatment for new entrants as well. And there were policy choices we made here in Scotland. Government and industry working closely together with the support of most parties, if not all, in this Parliament. For example, having three different payment regions, like having a five-year transition from historic to area payments and new couple support schemes for the beef and sheep sectors. However, there were always going to be consequences of these decisions. In the old cap, we had two schemes in Pillar 1, the Single Farm Payment and Scottish Beef Scheme, both of which were applied uniformly across the whole of the country. Today, we have six schemes in Pillar 1, the basic payments, greening, younger farmer, top-up, mainland beef, island beef and upland sheep. Every one of them involves geographic targeting. 
And that targeting is done in three different ways across the six schemes. Now, we've made those policy changes in order to tailor the new cap to Scotland's needs. We had meeting after meeting after meeting with industry leaders. The discussions were often intense, but the decisions were right and strongly supported by the industry and by this Parliament. So we made all of those choices with our eyes wide open. And it was always made clear to the industry in particular that more complexity would have an impact on the payment timetables. NFU Scotland indeed have confirmed they knew about that and accepted it. So we now have to calculate around 4 million hectares worth of new payment entitlements, not just for 2015, but for the whole transition period up to 2019. Some administrations, of course, don't need to do that if they made different policy choices in previous years. In England, DEFRA decided to adopt area-based payments from 2005 after the last cap reform. This means calculating payments in England is much, much easier, and they don't have to define new regions or issue new entitlements, even though, despite that, they still face challenges. But here in Scotland, we have to allocate around 400 fields into three payment regions for the basic payment part of Pillar 1. Thankfully, that work is virtually complete, but it's been a major undertaking. Meanwhile, our IT teams have been writing millions of lines of new computer code to implement this complex new policy within the tight timetable ta time imposed by the EU. So where are we as of today? Well, on the 17th of November, I gave the Rural Affairs Committee a written update. I said we aim to start payments with a first payment run that should cover around a quarter of claimants. I said that the first payments should begin arriving by the end of December, the majority in January, and all farmers should receive their first instalment in March and the balance in April. I also said last month that the first instalment payment would be at least 70% of an individual payment. And I can confirm today that we are on track for that start date for payments. The first payment run to around 25% of farmers will get underway before Christmas, with payments beginning to arrive in farmers' accounts before the new year. And I know that almost everyone will be keen to know when his or her payment will be made. The answer to this under the new cap is of course the same as the answer was under the old cap because it depends on each individual case. Straightforward cases, perhaps where there have been little or no change from last year, should need less processing than others. If the case is more complex or if it's one of the small percentage we've had to inspect, then processing takes longer. In some cases, the European rules require us to contact the farmer for more information. In that scenario, I would urge farmers to respond quickly so that we can get on with processing their claim. And I've even heard stories of who have written to farmers two or three times and still yet to hear back so we can get on with processing their claim and make sure we've got the accurate information. Farmers and crofters are also keen to know the value of their entitlements under the new cap. As required by Europe, we will, by the end of the year, issue to farmers illustration letters, illustration letters setting out the number and value of claimed entitlements for every year from 2015 to 2019. I have to emphasise that this will only be an illustration as it is a European requirement and will not be the levels of actual payments necessarily. Because under EU rules, we must then confirm the final value of entitlements after all claims have been processed by the 1st of April. So the illustrations are because of the European entitlement to get them out by the end of this year and then the final values by the 1st of April. So farmers will have full visibility of their five-year transition at that point. And I know people are looking forward keenly to getting this information. And here too, the more complex cases may, of course, have to wait a little longer than others. I would say if that causes any problems for any individual farmer or crofter, they should contact their area office. Or they could contact our new helpline, 0300 300 222, which opened last week and is open for office hours. Don't worry, Alec Johnson, it's uh, now part of the official report, to help customers get to grips with the complexities of the new cap. We also sent an expansion leaflet to all farmers in early December so they know what to expect over the coming months. And we've been in contact with the banks, and indeed I've met them all personally, to encourage them to help the industry through the coming months. This is undoubtedly a difficult time, and of course I have to thank all our farmers and crofters for their patience. We know how important these payments are, but it is an unprecedented task, I repeat, for the government, 
but we must get it absolutely right and make every effort to make sure that's the case. We cannot have Scottish farmers facing the chaos of incorrect payments or the loss of funding through EU disallowance that their counterparts elsewhere have faced in the past. The Scottish Government has had an exceptional record of making cap payments in previous years, but 2015 was always going to be different. But no one should doubt the Government's determination to deliver for the agricultural community. The £440 million of support that will be issued in the coming months through Pillar 1 of the new cap alone is vital to food production, is vital to our environment and to our rural communities in the Scottish economy. Both the industry and myself, and I believe most parties, if not all in this Parliament, agreed that even if it meant a different timetable, it was a price worth paying to ensure payments are as targeted and as effective as we can make them. So on that note, Deputy Presiding Officer, I urge Parliament to support the Government's work to make these much-needed payments under this jointly designed policy as quickly as we can. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we will need to move to the next item of business. If members wish to ask a question, please press request to speak buttons now. I call Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance notice of his statement? I do agree that we all knew that cap payments were going to be complex. But the job of the Cabinet Secretary is to provide leadership to his department to ensure the system worked. And this statement makes no reference to the fact that the computer system used was spectacularly over-complex, over-designed and completely unreliable. And there was systemic failure which has contributed to delays. The farmers and thousands of rural jobs and communities they rely on deserved better. I know from repeated Freedom of Information requests just how chaotic the whole system has been. So the last time I asked the Cabinet Secretary how many farms are still to be visited, exactly when individual farmers know when and how much they can expect to receive, and when will they actually get those payments? Because it's still not clear from today's statement. We're well into the payment window, and we're three years after the Scottish Government designed its business case. Will farmers know if they are straightforward or complex, intuitively? When will they find out when they will get their payments? And will the Cabinet Secretary compensate those farmers for the cost of loans taken out as a direct result of the administrative failure of the Cabinet Secretary and his department? Today does feel like an abdication of responsibility, and this statement disappoints once again. There is still uncertainty, and not even a hint of an apology. I think our farmers and their livelihoods who depend on them deserve better. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, firstly, can I say to Sarah Boyack, we are not well into the payment window. This is the 10th of December and the payment window is several months long. Uh, the previous cap, yes, we had an excellent payment record, which, because the payment window opened on the 1st of December and we managed to get the majority of payments out pretty quickly after the 1st of December. But the old policy is radically different to the policy we are dealing with at the moment. And the reason why the, there have been issues with the IT system, I'm happy to acknowledge that. It's, it's a very complex IT system, but it's dealing with a very complex policy. If we'd had a simple policy, the IT would have been simpler, and we've perhaps not had as many difficulties as we've had. But because of an extremely complex policy in Scotland, that has led to some issues with the IT system. And if there are lessons to be learned, of course, we will have to learn those lessons. But as Sarah Boyack and others will see, what other administrations have had to go through that have had to deal with similar challenges and similar transitional periods. Particularly the UK Government, when they moved from historic payments to area payments in 2005, where I think it was only 24% of recipients in England had their payment by April when they moved from historic to area payments. In 2015, what Scotland is doing is not only moving from historic to area payments, we are introducing three different payment regions at the same time, and new couple schemes and various other new measures all at the same time, and at the request of many political parties in this chamber and indeed the wider agricultural sector. So I do thank the industry for its forbearance, for its patience. I have met many, many farmers over the last two or three weeks alone, including 70 on Monday evening in my own constituency, and I can assure you the vast majority of farmers I am speaking to are very reasonable about this. And I think we have to accept the key point here is that hundreds of millions of pounds of support is going to make its way to Scotland's farming community in the coming weeks and months. Alec Ferguson. 
Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I also thank the Cabinet Secretary for the advanced copy of his statement. Uh, in October 2014, the NFUS issued a press release welcoming the fact that the Scottish Government had made the growing of nitrogen-fixing crops a viable option for Scottish farmers, saying, importantly, the rules will allow farmers to grow only one crop rather than two in 2015 to qualify. Now, just 14 months later, the NFUS is accusing the Scottish Government with considerable justification of gold plating greening issues, including an insistence that two nitrogen fixing crops be grown within an ecological focus area. So can I ask why is the Cabinet Secretary gold plating so much within the greening proposals to the ultimate detriment of Scotland's arable sector? And what action is he taking to address the concerns raised as he has pledged to do? And secondly, I have no doubt that SRPID staff are doing everything possible to get basic payments out as soon as possible. But can I ask what impact that human resource effort is going to have in the timing of future payments uh, to schemes such as LFAS, the Beef Calf Scheme, Agri-Environmental and other schemes? And can he confirm that despite a 1st of January deadline for SRD applications to be approved, not one application has yet been approved? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, there's a number of questions there in Alec Ferguson's uh, contribution. I, I will firstly touch upon the nitrogen crops issue, which is uh, a topical issue, as he quite rightly says. Uh, firstly, within the greening measures largely imposed on Scotland through the new Common Agricultural Policy, Scotland had to take some decisions within that. One of the decisions we had to take was to, to, to define what would be allowed within the ecologically focused areas, where 5 per cent is put aside for environmental purposes. Many stakeholders wanted no nitrogen fixed crops to be allowed as part of that, whereas the NFU and some others wanted all nitrogen fixed crops to be allowed as part of that. Therefore, the compromise I put forward and have agreed is that nitrogen fixed crops can be allowed, but with certain management conditions to um, uh, uh, contribute towards the environment and make sure that was protected. So that's where we are with that. But Alec Ferguson is right, there's wider issues with the greening of the new policy. And there is a review of greening taking place at European level that this government has been calling for loudly for the last year or two. That will take place in 2016. We will make sure we contribute that to make sure the greening measures are very appropriate to Scottish circumstances. In terms of the impact and other payments, yes, there will be an impact because clearly the priority has been to get the basic payments um, out the door. Again, that is what we agreed with the industry. Uh, there's, there's always going to be a different timetable for the other payments in terms of some of these other payments are new. We didn't have a sheep couple scheme before. The first time that will happen uh, will be in 2016. Therefore, we have to get that right and get it out the door. Uh, so I will keep Parliament informed of those timetables. Clearly, I want to minimise the impact on those timetables. Uh, and if there are any other questions, the member should write to me because I think there are a lot of questions to ask there. Thank you. I'm afraid I have a number of requests, so unless questions are short and also answers to match, I'm afraid we won't get everyone in. Graham Day. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, when you addressed the subject of topical questions on November the 24th, you indicated that at that stage, circa 1,300 farm inspections remain to be carried out. Could you update the Chamber on subsequent progress made in this regard and indicate when it's anticipated this process might be concluded? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, one of the bureaucratic demands of, of Europe is that we have to start all the 1,300 inspections across all parts of Scotland before we can make any payments to any farmers. We are now on the brink of having achieved that, and that will be the case before the end of the year, which will be helpful. So that's the feedback we're now receiving from area offices around the country. So hopefully within a matter of days, all 1,300 inspections will have started, which will enable next year's uh, payments to get underway. Uh, in full, uh, as we hope to do as quickly as possible. Thank you. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, in his statement, the Cabinet Secretary says, um, we all made those choices with our eyes open, and I urge Parliament to support the Government's work to make these much-needed payments under this jointly designed policy as quickly as we can. These remarks, as part of today's statement, signal to me something of an abnegation of responsibility. The Cabinet Secretary lists some of the many complexities. Complexities or not, though, the delivery of payments is the sole responsibility of this Scottish Government and his department. I need a question. He has known for many months, and the, uh, the need to play catch-up has not caught up with things. Have you any comments, Cabinet Secretary? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I've got plenty of comments in response to Claudia Beamish's question. 
Firstly, I'm just trying to imagine in my head what would have happened, what the conversation would be today in the Chamber if I had not taken measures to tackle slipper farming in Scotland yeah. and our vital resources were going to those who are not genuinely active farmers. So the whole purpose behind some of the measures we've adopted is to suit the European framework to Scottish circumstances, because we've got hill farming, lowland farming, we've got island farming, mainland farming. Therefore, if we do not tailor and take advantage of the flexibilities we had, i.e. to have three different payment rates, three different payment regions, then I am sure the other political parties will be standing here today complaining that the Scottish Government had taken the wrong decisions and we should have just taken that bit longer to get them right. Thank you. Michael Russell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, it has been, as the Minister, uh, Cabinet Secretary said, a difficult year for agriculture with problems in milk, beef, weather and transport. It should have been a good year for barley growing, uh, given the demand in the whisky industry. When the Cabinet Secretary is in Europe next week uh, talking about greening, will he impress upon the European um, Commission the issue of greening and its impact on growing barley. In my constituency, for example, on the island of Isla, there is a genuine problem in growing the small amount of barley required for the organic distillery because of these new regulations. It would be immensely helpful to my constituents and I believe to his, represent, he represents even more distilleries than I do, to make sure that this was changed and that this gold plating was dropped. Cabinet Secretary. Well, without opening up a debate as to which part of Scotland the best whisky is produced in, uh, I am happy to say that I very much recognise the burden on our arable sector, particularly those growing barley for our Scotch whisky sector, be that in Isla or Speyside or elsewhere in Scotland. That's why next week I am meeting the European Commission to ask for the equivalence measures that we are putting forward to replace the three crop rules part of greening should be given further consideration because the European Commission are only saying we can do that if it's shaped in such a way it's completely unworkable and will be unattractive to the arable sector in Scotland and therefore we'd be stuck with the three crop rule which is largely designed for monoculture in Eastern Europe and elsewhere and not Scottish circumstances. Thank you. John Lamott. Um, <coughs> thank you, um, Sitting Officer. Um, I note the Cabinet Secretary's comments about the impact of flooding being minimal, but many borders farms have been affected, which will simply compound the news that they won't receive full payments until April. Will the Scottish Government prioritise payments to farmers in my constituency who have suffered as a result of flood damage? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I say to the member that if he's able to pass me any details of farmers affected by flooding, I'd very much appreciate that. Clearly, in the last couple of days, we're doing our best to speak to local representatives and through the NFU, and we'll continue to do that this week. So if there are examples, please, any other member as well, contact us with the details. In terms of whether we can uh, give extra help to those farmers, I think I would urge them all to contact their regional offices, but I'll certainly give that some thought. I'm doing that already, but I think it's a fair point that John Lamont uh, raises. It will all depend on the individual circumstances of the farms. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, I draw the Chamber's attention to the fact that I have a very small registered agricultural holding and also state I receive no public funding uh, for it. Um, Cabinet Secretary, the uh, basic and greening payments process has been at the heart of what you've said today, but farmers are also wishing to be assured uh, that the coupled support scheme for beef and for sheep and indeed the £60 million for LFA areas uh, is also unscheduled to be paid in reasonable time. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, sure, Stevenson is right. We have to uh, recognise the importance of the other payments that will, will happen separate from the basic payments in, in the coming months. Uh, normally, we pay the beef calf scheme in April. The LFAS payments would go out around about March. I have half said publicly already there could potentially be a few weeks delay to some of those payments because the message we have had from the industry is all our efforts and resources should be focused on the main basic and greening payments, etc. Uh, however, clearly, I am very keen to minimise any impact on the other payments given the fragility of some of the sectors involved uh, and the cash flow issues they face. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The, the Cabinet Secretary uh, mentioned in his statement, speaking with the banks, encouraging them to help uh, farmers through the coming months. We uh, hear reported that at least one bank has agreed to waive arrangement fees on loans farmers require to bridge because of late payments. Uh, will the Cabinet Secretary consider a scheme to compensate farmers for interest payments incurred in such circumstances? Cabinet Secretary. Well, every farming business in Scotland has got its own business plan, its own business practices, and I have spoken to the banks and they 
were relatively relaxed about the impact of the timetable for payments in, in Scotland uh, and are very willing and keen to speak to any a farmer who has cash flow difficulties and they will be sympathetic. So I'll continue to focus my efforts on ensuring the banks are being as cooperative uh, as possible. Thank you. Rob Gibson. I ask uh, the Cabinet Secretary whether the lowest payments of Region 3 applicants, that's mainly crofters, have been complicated due to the time taken to process their claims following the insistence of the NFUS on a three-region model instead of two. And if this disadvantage for crofters has been added to where their in-by land goes along with their portion of common grazing, which has meant more inspections of these claims. Cabinet Secretary. I thank Rob Gibson for highlighting the issues facing crofting, and there are some issues which I am currently investigating. I would, of course, just point out that our modelling estimates that under the new policy, the amount of direct payments crofters receive is likely to increase from around £20 million in 2013 to around £33 million by 2019. So overall, the changes should bring a, a beneficial uh, boost to, to payments to our crofting counties. In terms of the three regions, I support the three-region model. Uh, the reason why I do that is because crofters and farmers generally were asking for measures to tackle slipper farming. Therefore, those who have the least activity should get the least level of payment compared to those who are more uh, active farmers. I think we all agree that's the case. So I will continue to pay close attention to the impact on uh, crofters in Rob Gibson's constituency uh, and elsewhere in Scotland. Thank you, Jim Hume. Grateful for advance sight of the Cabinet Secretary's statement and of course, uh, remind members of my register of, of interest. Uh, we have been waiting for months for clarity o on cap uh, distribution. There has been real frustration worry in rural Scotland, and there is no doubt that the, the, the Government's delay in payments will have serious repercussions for agriculture in Scotland. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary noted in his statement that a new helpline was launched last week to help farmers get to grips with the reformed cap. I have been informed that some farmers calling have found it to be of little use. Mr. Therefore, Humanity will the question. Cabinet Secretary explain more about who is staffing these lines, what information they will be able to provide, and will he ensure that they have the expertise needed to help farmers at this critical time? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we are urging any crofter or farmer who has an issue to visit the regional office. And the feedback I have had is that they find that immensely helpful. I hope the helpline is being helpful. If it's not being, there are specific circumstances. I ask Jim Hume or anyone else to, to send the details to me. I will certainly look into that. Um, I could gently remind Jim Hume that both uh, the Conservatives and Lib Dems were in coalition for a few years, and at that point they were arguing to scrap pillar one of the common agricultural policy. And if it was up to them and they would got their way, we would not be discussing any direct payments at the moment, because there would not be any. Mark <clears throat> Given the tremendous problems farmers and land agents have had to face because of uncertainty surrounding payment amounts and times, what does the Cabinet Secretary commit to do in the future to help farmers submit forms or access their specific payment information when they may not have consistent broadband connections? Cabinet Secretary. Well, clearly the government is engaged in rolling broadband out across Scotland. It is a big priority, particularly for my colleague sitting on my right-hand side, uh, John Swinney, the Deputy First Minister. And the huge sums are being invested in ensuring that our rural communities do have access to, to online application forms. If they if unable to do that, they again should visit their local office where they will get assistance uh, to do that. I should also remind uh, the Chamber that for the applications for the new common agricultural policy, despite all the publicity around the online issues, 65 per cent of applications were online compared to 35 per cent by paper. So an increasing number of applicants are using online, but we will certainly continue to pay close attention to that and support it. Thank you. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. Uh, the Scottish Government has obviously put a high priority on the involvement of uh, new entrants and those currently in farming without a subsidy in these reforms. So can the Cabinet Secretary tell us what stage the Scottish Government is at with processing the new entrant grant applications? Cabinet Secretary. Well, different parts of the SRTP are at different stages. So the agri-environment schemes, for instance, um, are, are now in and will be taken to the next stage in January. And other parts of the capital schemes, particularly new entrants, are underway as well. I'm happy to send a proper update if, if Liz Smith is looking for specific figures. Uh, but I would also remind the Chamber that one of the decisions we took in Scotland, again, which added into the, the complex mix, was to ensure that the new policy in Scotland catered for new entrants. Because one of the big flaws in the previous common agricultural policy is that uh, new entrants were largely excluded from getting support. 
where, ironically, inactive farmers were getting support, which was wholly unacceptable, and we have managed to change that. Roger Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Uh, reference has been made uh, earlier, to Cabinet Secretary, to discussions with the banks. I know you met representatives of the banks on the 19th of November. Is there anything further that you can tell the Chamber about those discussions? Cabinet Secretary, <coughs> briefly as possible. I can really only reiterate what I've said already. Is that I, I did meet the banks uh, personally. I know that stakeholders, particularly the NFU in Scotland, have also met the banks. They're being very cooperative. If there are issues where that's not the case, I would ask members to contact me and let me know. And also. I think we can all take responsibility for urging our constituents who do face cash flow problems to notify their own banks as soon as possible because their banks are keen to hear from them to help. Thank you. And the last brief question and answer, Jamie McGregor. Uh, thank you. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware that the Scottish Crofting Federation is warning that the delays in payments to crofters could prove ruinous? What is his response to those crofters? Cabinet Secretary. Well, my response is that the new common agricultural policy, as I've indicated before, will deliver a greater amount of the direct payments to our crofting counties in this country, uh, going from now until 2019 over the phasing in of the new system. And we will continue to work flat out. We have hundreds of officials working flat out round the clock in the Scottish Government to make sure we can get the payments out as quickly as possible. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That ends the statement. And we now move to the next item of business, which is stage three proceedings on the inquiries into fatal accidents and sudden deaths, etc. Scotland Bill. In dealing with amendments, members should have the bill as amended at stage two, SP Bill 63A, the marshalled list, SP Bill 63A. AML and the groupings SP Bill 63 AG. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes from the first division of the, for the first division of the afternoon. The period of voting for the first division will be 30 seconds. Thereafter, I will allow a voting period of one minute for the first division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any groups of amendments should press the request to speak buttons as soon as I call that group. Members should now please refer to the marshalled list of amendments. And we turn to Group 1, Mandatory Inquiries, Persons Detained Under Mental Health Legislation. And I call Amendment 2 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 3, 4, 36, 5, 37, 38, 6, 39, 7 and 8. And I ask the Minister to move Amendment 2 and speak to all amendments in the group. Please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, this group of amendments relate to mandatory FEIs for patients detained under mental health legislation which were introduced at stage two by amendments pressed by Margaret Mitchell and passed by the Justice Committee. Margaret Mitchell's amendments mean that there will be a mandatory fatal accident inquiry into every death of a person detained under mental health legislation unless certain exceptions apply. The Scottish Government's amendments seek to reverse the effect of Margaret Mil Mitchell's amendments. Amendment four removes a redundant definition of mental disorder, which is not referred to in the bill. This should be removed whether or not the other amendments in the group are agreed to. The definition is no longer required, as it is only relevant to patients receiving treatment in hospital on a voluntary basis. Sub, uh, subsequent to stage two, several bodies have written to the Scottish Government and members of the Scottish Parliament to express their opposition to these amendments made at stage two and offer their support to have them reversed at stage three. And this is what the, the Government's amendments seek to do. The Royal College of Psychiatrists said that, and I quote, it is stigmatising to suggest mental health care and treatment should be subject to special scrutiny in relation to patient deaths, unquote. The Scottish Association of Mental Health, or SAMH, a charity that supports and campaigns for people with mental health problems, says that the amendments, and I quote, are disproportionate and could add to the distress of bereaved families, unquote. The British Medical Association Scotland has said that, and I quote, there are of course deaths which would benefit from further investigation, but it is more appropriate for the fiscal to make the decision than to have a mandatory FEI for all cases, unquote. The amendments were not supported by the Mental Welfare Commission Scotland either, which believed that the provision was disproportionate and would not achieve the aims of national learning. Penumbra and the Mental Health Nurses Forum Scotland have also expressed their opposition. And I understand members' concerns that we must ensure that proper care is given to those who are detained by the state due to their mental health problems, especially as they are some of the most vulnerable in our society. However, I believe that the systems that are now in place and the statutory review that will soon be undertaken best ensure this is the case. Currently, the Mental Welfare Commission for Scotland may undertake an investigation where it is alleged that a mental health patient may have been subject or exposed to ill treatment, neglect or some other deficiency in care or treatment. 
The Chief Medical Officer issued a formal circular to practitioners in November this year, making it mandatory for all deaths while subject to compulsory treatment under mental health legislation to be reported to the Procurator Fiscal. This ensures not only that an independent investigation can currently be carried out by the Procurator Fiscal to establish if there is any issue of criminality, but if there is no criminality and it, it is in the public interest, perhaps because there is suspicion of a deficiency in care or treatment, then the Lord Advocate can hold a discretionary fatal accident inquiry. This demonstrates that in the event that no FEI is to be held, this does not mean that there has been, uh, not been an investigation of the death. Indeed, of the 5,500 death investigations carried out by the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service each year, only 50 to 60 lead to an FEI. But for all those other deaths that are reported to the Crown Office, the, the circumstances have been explored by the Procurator Fiscal. In addition, Section 37 of the Mental Health Scotland Act 2015 requires a statutory review of the arrangements for investigating the death of a patient who was detained in hospital by virtue of the Mental Health Scotland Act 2003. Uh, or the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995, or who was admitted voluntarily to hospital for the purpose uh, of receiving treatment for a mental disorder. This provision was the result of an amendment lodged by Dr Richard Simpson and was supported unanimously by this Parliament. At the instruction of the Minister for Sport, Health Improvement and Mental Health, the Scottish Government laid an order uh, this week uh, commencing this provision, which will come into force on the 24th of December, and any change to FEIs in these cases would preempt this review. This will be a review that has been and will be widely welcomed by stakeholders. The Mental Welfare Commission, in its stage three briefing to MSPs, considers the review to be, and I quote, an important opportunity to create a system of investigation of non-natural deaths of psychiatric patients, which is proportionate, streamlined and effective, unquote. Although not a primary consideration of the potential impact, it is important to note that mandatory FEIs for detained mental health patients will effectively double the number of FEIs per year. This has been detailed in the supplementary financial memorandum to accompany the bill. It would mean one out of every two FEIs would relate to a mental health patient, which would be disproportionate and would, in my view, and that of stakeholders, cause unnecessary distress to families of the deceased. Dr Elaine Murray's amendments are, I suspect, lodged to mitigate this, uh, as they would mean that the Lord Advocate may decide that an inquiry is not to be held into the death if satisfied the death is from natural causes. This is an acknowledgement by Dr Murray, perhaps, that the provision via an, ex an exception in Margaret Mitchell's amendments for the Lord Advocate not to hold an, a mandatory FEI if there has been a Mental Welfare Commission investigation is not enough. However, her amendment could give rise to practical issues of interpretation and application. There is no definition of natural cause, and it raises more questions than it answers on, on perhaps on what basis would the Lord Advocate be satisfied that the death was from natural causes. How is natural cause to be defined for the purposes of this provision? This amendment could also lead to challenges by judicial review to the Lord Advocate's decision not to hold an FEI if, for example, the family believes that the death was not from natural causes. For these reasons, the Government wishes to reverse the amendments by Margaret Mitchell to return the bill to the original policy in respect of the treatment of mental health patients. Dr Murray's amendments are based on Margaret Mitchell's stage two amendments remaining in the bill. Therefore, if these are removed, Dr Murray has nothing to gain by pressing her amendments. And for the reasons outlined, the Government opposed the amendments uh, lodged by Elaine, Dr Elaine Murray as well. The Scottish Government position is supported by a broad range of mental health organisations who work at the front line and represent mental health patients and those that work with and care for them. And to recap, that's the Mental Welfare Commission for Scotland, the Royal College of Psychiatrists, BMA Scotland, Penumbra, Mental Health Nurses Forum for Scotland and Enable. Therefore, I ask uh, Dr Elaine Murray to withdraw her amendments and I move Amendment 2 in my name. Thank you. Can I call Elaine Murray to speak to Amendment 36 and to other amendments in the group? Please, Dr Murray. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. At stage 2, the committee agreed by majority vote to amend the bill to require mandatory fatal accident inquiries when a person dies in compulsory detention under the Mental Health Care and Treatment Scotland Act 2003. This was in accord with Lord Cullen's rec recommendations in his review and had been supported during his consultation by organisations such as Enable. In addition, deaths of patients in compulsory detention in England and Wales are subject to a coroner's inquest. The bill, as amended, also allowed the Lord Advocate to make an exception where the circumstances of the death had been established through an investigation under Section 11 of the 2003 Act. However, it did not allow the Lord Advocate to make an exception where the cause of death was of natural causes and would not be subject to an investigation under this Act. Therefore, deaths of persons compulsorily detained from natural causes uh, 
where, where the death was from natural causes, I should say, rather than detention, uh, would always be subject to a mandatory inquiry without any exception, which could be unnecessary and distressing to their friends and family. My Amendment 37 would enable the Lord Advocate to make an exception of deaths which were from natural causes. Two thirds of people who die in compulsory detention die of natural causes, and this, then, there is no, there should not be any requirement to conduct a fatal accident inquiry into these deaths, which everybody understands why they have happened. However, since the bill was amended, we have received representations from a number of professional organisations and also organisations, and crucially organisations, representing people with mental health conditions and their families, which urge us to repeal these sections altogether. The Mental Welfare Commission believes that the priority should be for the review of the arrangements to for investigating the deaths of detained patients to be established and that legislating at this stage would preempt the results of the review. Care representatives on the Royal College of Psychiatrists in Scotland advise that delays involved in the FAI process would have a significant and negative impact on bereaved carers. Penumbra agree with the views of the MWC and the Royal College of Psychiatrists Scotland. The briefing from Enable, which uh, had made the original uh, submission uh, to Lord Cullen, sent to us yesterday was, I felt, ambiguous, uh, and I contacted their policy offer, officer yesterday afternoon to clarify their position. She advised me by email that they have accepted the government's position on the amendments, providing that there is a firm commitment that the review required by Section 37 of the Mental Health Scotland Act 2015 into the investigation of the deaths of detained patients is progressed as a matter of urgency. This review is the result, as the, the Minister has already said, of an, of, a, of an amendment brought by my colleague Richard Simpson and unanimously supported by the Parliament. The Minister for Sport, Health Improvement and Mental Health wrote to the Chair of the Health and Wellbeing Community, Dun uh, Committee, Duncan McNeill, earlier this week to advise that he intended to lay an order yesterday, uh, which comes into force on 24th of December, which would clarify the deadline for the review to be completed. Uh, if the Minister or possibly his colleague, uh, the Minister for Health, can confirm that this order has been laid and can advise of the deadline for the completion of the review, I consider that the Stage 2 amendments have made a, a, an important contribution to this debate and to the acceleration of the review. Thank you. Jamie Hepburn. I can confirm to the Member and indeed the whole Chamber I have laid that order. Uh, as uh, Mr Wheelhouse uh, laid out, it will come into effect from 24th of December of this year. Uh, the provision that we unanimously uh, as a parliament legislated for, should that uh, is that review should be take place within three years. But my clear commitment to this uh, chamber, presiding officer, is that uh, review should commence as soon as possible. Thank you, Dr. Murray. Could you come to a close, please? Indeed, uh, presiding officer. Uh, in light of those uh, assurances, I will not pre uh, press my amendments, and Labour governments will support the government amendments in removing the stage two amendments. Thank you. I currently have three members requesting to speak. Could I ask if contributions could be kept as short as possible? Margaret Mitchell to be followed by Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The reality is, if this Amendment 3 is agreed to, if this Amendment 3 is agreed to, then mental health adults detained on a com compulsory basis will have fewer human rights uh, than criminals do who die in custody. And I remain of the view, which was originally stated by the charity Enable Scotland, when they said that they thought deaths of people detained under the Mental Health Care Treatment Scotland Act 2003 should be included in the mandatory category. These, those individuals who have been deprived of their liberi liberty should have the same protection as those detained in a prison or police cell. Thank you. Roger Campbell to be followed by Alison McInnes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Since we heard evidence on this matter at Stage 1, uh, things have moved on. At Stage 1, the Scottish Human Rights Commission did say that there was a, a gap in relation to the protection of the right to life for those who die in a mental health detention. And indeed, the Mental Welfare Commission also uh, commented, whilst opposing mandatory uh, 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 inquiries, that they thought the current system was inadequate. So we have moved on with the Section 37 and the order which the, uh, Jamie Hepburn has referred to already, and also the Chief Medical Officer's circular. So I think in the light of all that, in the light of all that's been said, we should be 
content to support the government's amendment. And one final point in the question of relation to um, mandatory inquiries, we should perhaps take account of the fact that uh, in the House of Commons, the Labour MP for, for Stockport is seeking to scrap the Chief Coroner's current guidance that people subject to deprivation of liberty safeguards are in state detention and should automatically have an inquest because of the distress that causes to many people uh, and families of sufferers from dementia down south. So, thank you. Thank you. At stage two, Margaret Mitchell's amendment to require a mandatory FEI for the death of any patient who died while receiving treatment for a mental disorder was further amended by my own amendment to re remove reference to voluntary patients. And the bill, as it now stands, as the Minister has said, provides for a mandatory FEI for any patient who dies while detained under the Mental Health Care and Treatment Act. And it provides an opt-out for the Lord Advocate. I think that effectively flipped the arrangements from what they were previously, when the Lord Advocate could, if he considered it appropriate, order an FEI. And I supported that move at stage two, as the Scottish Human Rights Commission had advised that steps needed to be taken to ensure that systems of investigation meet Article 2 requirements of ECHR and to remedy the current gaps and confusion in the system. I hope we can all agree that when the state has the responsibility for someone's care and health, that there should be a thorough and independent process to ascertain the reason for death. I acknowledge that there is disagreement over whether the FAI route is the right pro process. And I have further reflected on the evidence submitted by Sam H, the BMA, Royal College of Psychiatrists and the Mental Welfare Commission, who all oppose the mandatory FEI approach. And they argue that it is disproportionate, that it adds significantly to workload, and perhaps most compellingly for me, that it risks stigmatisation and would increase the distress of bereaved families. I have concluded on balance that there is a more proportionate and less distressing way to proceed that involves reform of the whole system of notifications and investigation rather than focusing solely on FEIs. And I will therefore support the government's amendments removing the provision. But today, when Jeremy Hunt is in Westminster saying he's profoundly shocked by the failure to investigate um, unexpected deaths of mental health patients in a particular um, NHS trust in England and Wales, we, we can't be complacent. So in doing so, and in supporting these amendments, I urge the Minister to lose no time in proceeding with the review agreed in the Mental Health Act 2015 and ask him to pay particular heed to the views of Sam H that there is a particular issue relating to suicides while under care. Thank you. I did ask members to be brief, so join Finney briefly, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Simply to say that I had supported Margaret Mitchell's um, position at stage two, but I've, I've heard, like others, particularly uh, Elaine Murray and Alison McInnes, compelling evidence, not only from the practitioners, but those who support the people who are in, in these circumstances. So I, I certainly will be supporting the government's position. Many thanks. Can I now invite the Minister to wind up, please? Uh, th thank you, Presiding Officer. I'll keep this brief because uh, I'm conscious of time. Um, I just want to add, because the issue of human rights has been raised uh, by members, uh, and I thank the, uh, Alison McInnes, John Finney and Elaine Murray for, their, for their, their, their responses. The Chief Medical Officer's circular and the guidance by the Crown Office on reporting deaths to the Procurator Fiscal has been issued uh, so that deaths of detained patients can be independently investigated uh, in accordance with Article 2 of ECHR. Um, this, this strengthens the realisation of Scotland the right to life enshrined in Article 2 of the European Convention of Human Rights and the long-standing Scottish tradition of Crown discretion is well suited, we think, to the requirements of European law, but I take the point on board that Alison McInnes made that, and clearly the Minister has, has indicated that the, the review of Section 37 will look at this more comprehensively. Many thanks. Uh, that brings us to the question then, and the question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. This is the first division of this stage and of the afternoon, so therefore I um, I will suspend for five minutes and thereafter we will have a 30 second division.
order. We will now proceed with the division on Amendment 2. This is a 30-second division. Members should cast their votes now, please. Order, please. The result of the vote on Amendment Number Two is yes, 94; no, 14. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. That then brings us to Amendment Three in the name of the Minister, which has already been debated with Amendment Two, and I ask the Minister to move formally. Formally moved. Thank you. Question is that Amendment Three be agreed to. Are we all agreed? <coughs> We are not. There will be a division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number three is yes, 94, no, 14. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to. I now call amendment four in the name of the minister already debated with amendment two and I ask the minister to move formally. I uh, moved. Thank you. Question is that amendment four be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I call Amendment 36 in the name of Elaine Murray, already debated with Amendment 2, and I ask Elaine Murray to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. In which case, I now call Amendment 5 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 2, and I ask the Minister to move formally. Moved. Thank you. Question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I call Amendment 37 in the name of Elaine Murray, already debated with Amendment 2, and I ask Elaine Murray to move or not to move. Not move. In which case, I now call Amendment 38 in the name of Elaine Murray, already debated with Amendment 2, and I ask Elaine Murray to move or not move. Not moved. Thank you. That then brings me to calling Amendment 6 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 2, and I ask the Minister to move formally, please. Moved. Question is that Amendment 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I call Amendment 39 in the name of Elaine Murray, already debated with Amendment 2, and ask Elaine Murray to move or not move. Not moved. I call Amendment 7 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 2, and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved. The question then is that Amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I now call Amendment 8 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 2, and I ask the Minister to move formally. Moved. Thank you. Question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. That then brings us to Group 2, Participation of Trade Unions and Similar Bodies in Inquiries. And I call Amendment 9 in the name of the Minister, which is grouped with Amendments 10, 11 and 12. And I ask the Minister to move Amendment 9 and speak to all of the amendments in the group, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the Scottish Government is happy to an accept, accept an amendment laid at Stage 2 by Elaine Murray, which gives a statutory right of participation at a fatal accident inquiry to a trade union or staff association, though I did say that we would consider if the wording could be improved at Stage 3. We have now held those discussions with uh, Dr Murray, and I am pleased to say that uh, Dr Murray has indicated that she would consent with the proposed amendments. Um, Content with the proposed amendment, sorry. Dr Murray explained that her amendment was intended to cover sectors where trade union membership was not permitted by law, uh, like the police. The term staff association does not, however, have a recognised legal meaning. It could arguably cover the likes of internal equality networks or even sports or social associations. 
Consideration has been given to alternative wording which would deliver the policy intention. Amendments 10 and 12 will cover bodies similar to trade unions, for example, where trade union membership is prohibited, and makes it clear that the body must represent the interests of workers in connection with the employment or occupation during which the accident resulting in the death happened. This is intended to exclude bodies of workers having a purely social function, for example, a sports association, and also bodies which represent workers' interests more generally, such as political bodies. Amendment 10 also makes clear that the requirement that the representation of workers' interests must be, and I quote, in a connection with the employment or occupation concerned, unquote, also applies to the trade union. Um, Amendment 9 makes it clear that participation should be for a trade union or similar body itself, and not for a, a representative. Amendment 11 is uh, consequential. I hope that Dr Murray and other members will welcome these amendments which clarify and improve on the original stage two amendment and I move amendment nine in my name. Many thanks and I call Elaine Murray. Uh, presiding officer, as the Minister said, I introduced an amendment at stage two into section 10 to give a trade union or staff association representative of a, of a person killed in the course of their employment the statutory right to participate in a fatal accident inquiry into their death. Uh, the bill gives this statutory right to their employer and to health and safety inspectors, and I felt it was important that the participation of trade union or staff association representatives should be given parity, not least for the support they can provide to the deceased family. The amendment was accepted unanimously, but I recognised at the time that the wording probably needed tidying up. Uh, as the Minister said, the uh, term staff association caused some problems with its definition. But I was keen that where a police officer, for example, who died in the course of their employment, which sadly happens more often in that profession than most, the Scottish Police Federation or the Association of Police Superintendents should have equal rights to attend to the equivalent trade unions. The amendments into Group 2 revise the wording while retaining the policy intention of my Stage 2 amendments, and therefore we are happy to support them. Thank you. No other member has requested to speak, so I ask the Minister to now wind up. I'm happy to, to leave it, uh, President Officer. Thank you. In which case, the question is that Amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We are. I now call Amendments 10, 11 and 12, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. And I invite the Minister to move Amendments 10 to 12 on block, please. Formally moved. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on Amendments 10 to 12? Since no member has objected, the question then is that amendments 10 to 12 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. That then brings us to Group 3, Availability of Civil Legal Aid. And I call Amendment 1 in the name of Patricia Ferguson, which is grouped with Amendment 13. And I ask Patricia Ferguson to please move Amendment 1 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to move Amendment No. 1 in my name and to oppose Amendment 13 in the name of the Minister. At Stage 2, my amendment, which was agreed by the Justice Committee and sought to ensure one of the key findings of Lord Cullen's reports into FEIs would be implemented, namely that civil legal aid would be available to the families of the bereaved to allow them to be represented at an FEI. As the Parliament is aware, this bill has its genesis in the review of FAIs undertaken by Lord Cullen at the request of the Scottish Government. Lord Cullen made two particularly important points in relation to legal aid for families who wish to participate in FAIs. The first is that relatives often believe that the Procurator Fiscal attends an FAI to look after their interests if they are unrepresented. But the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service's own guidance makes it clear that this is not the case and also indicates that the role of the Procurator Fiscal is to represent to the court any matter affecting the public interest, not that of the bereaved families. Indeed, the Procurator Fiscal is perfectly entitled to decline to put questions on behalf of the families. The second point Lord Cullen made was that FAIs take place whether or not relatives consent to them. But if rel relatives want to participate, their ability to do so without representation is limited, and they are at a considerable disadvantage compared to other interested parties. Indeed, the Faculty of Advocates stated in evidence to Lord Cullen that, and I quote, it is impossible for relatives to participate effectively in important inquiries without legal representation, while Sheriff JP Murphy observed that the relatives, and I quote, should not be expected to be capable of self-representation in the traumatic situation of an FAI. I have never seen a lay person do it adequately. 
My amendment had the effect of disapplying the normal financial conditions and thresholds and required ministers to come forward with a special scheme of conditions for relatives involved in FAIs. I had deliberately not been prescriptive as to what those regulations should be, but had instead left to ministers the job of drawing up a scheme that would implement those intentions. And I was doing so in the context of a presumption that legal aid would be available and that families would be able to be represented throughout the process and would also not find that cash had run out partway through an FAI, as has happened. The impact of the Minister's Amendment number 13 is to remove the entire provision, meaning that bereaved families will not have access to legal aid. It seems to me that this is a basic principle and one that I hope Parliament will today uphold by rejecting the Minister's Amendment number 13. My Amendment number 1 seeks to ensure that when Ministers bring forward the scheme for legal aid, that I hope that they will, and that was agreed to at Stage 2, that they are required to do so by affirmative resolution. This would ensure that Parliament had the opportunity to consider if the provisions of the Scottish Government scheme fulfilled Parliament's objectives. Many thanks. I now invite the Minister to speak to Amendment 13 and to the other amendments in the group, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, this group of amendments relate, uh, as Patricia Ferguson has said, to the provision for legal aid for FEIs. Uh, Patricia Ferguson's amendment is only relevant if her Stage 2 amendment on legal aid stays on the face of the Bill. And for reasons I shall explain, uh, Amendment 13 laid in my name will reverse that amendment. The Bill, as amended at Stage 2, now provides for the establishment of a family charter, which will, as one of its effects, formalise the engagement between the bereaved family and the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service. And among the issues covered by the Charter, the Procurator Fiscal will engage with the family on matters where they seek clarity on the circumstances of the death of their loved one from the FEI to inform the Crown's questions of witnesses which will uh, seek to serve the public, of, of, as, as Patricia Ferguson said, seek to serve the public interest. Presiding officer, at present, if the bereaved family wishes to ask questions that the fiscal cannot ask in the public interest, they may be entitled to legal aid and will typically uh, qualify for legal aid if they meet the eligibility criteria. The key tests for agreeing legal aid are around probable cause and reasonableness. Probable cause will always be satisfied where a relative has a right to participate in a fatal accident inquiry, and so the main question for the Legal Aid Board will often be reasonableness. To give a real-life example of the reasonableness test in action, I am aware of an example where a relative was granted legal aid to explore specific mental health issues of the deceased that had been raised prior to that person's death. Further, I want to make clear that the reasonableness test will always be satisfied where a relative of the person requiring legal aid has died in prison. Civil legal aid has generous financial eligibility thresholds to ensure that anyone eligible will be granted legal aid, instead of controlling spend by restricting the types of cases that are eligible or capping the expenditure in any given year. Tests of reasonableness and probable cause are applied, as well as financial eligibility, to ensure that public funds are appropriately directed. Uh, I will briefly. Annabel Goldie. So does the Minister concede that the very next... Ms Goldie, I don't have your microphone. Could you check if your card's in properly, it's please? It's hiding under the lectern. I Thank apologise. Thank you. Uh, Minister, by the very nature of what a fatal accident inquiry is, is it not reasonable that both the family and the Legal Aid Board may have no idea about the facts that may be adduced in the course of the fatal accident inquiry, and therefore they may be at a genuine disadvantage if it is ruled they are ineligible for legal aid? Minister. I think in terms of the, the point I was just making was that where there's clearly either, a, a, and I'll come on to it in more depth, the, the, a disagreement perhaps in terms of the line of questioning that the Crown might want to take and, and the family might want to, to, to explore perhaps because it's not relevant to the public interest, there would be a case to be made of probable cause and reasonableness and in practice uh, relatives of those who, have, who are bereaved do get, uh, sorry, the, the bereaved relatives do get um, uh, access to legal aid for fatal accident inquiries already. So the point I'm making is we do not need a provision in the bill to enable legal aid to be made available when there is probable cause and reasonableness. That already happens under the current regulations. Um, as I was saying, in terms of the, the, the provisions as they stand, allow us to ensure that legal aid is available for a wide range of matters and that help is given where it is needed most. And this does contrast with the approach in England and Wales, where cuts to legal aid mean there is no longer access to legal help with specific types of family, medical, housing and welfare benefits problems. And in certain cases, people even have to provide evidence that they or their children have been victims of domestic abuse or violence in order to access legal aid. So we are trying to maintain the breadth of legal aid and uh, the principles of legal aid that underpin it. 
Removing the test for one type of proceedings, in this case fatal accident inquiries, would more importantly undermine the principles and the general approach to legal aid in Scotland, i.e. those of probable cause and reasonableness. If Amendment 13 is not passed, this would in effect, if I, I may just progress a bit, I'll bring uh, Ms Lamont in in a second. If Amendment 13 is not passed, this would in effect mean virtually automatic legal aid for fatal accident inquiries. It's simply not necessary for all parties to fatal accident inquiries to be legally represented. I do take on board the member's point about if, if something uh, developed during inquiry there, but the, the, the procurator fiscal will obviously have explored with the family as part of the family charter what areas they are they're keen to explore and what their concerns are about the inquiry uh, prior to going in. That's a, a new innovation in, as part of the bill. But it's simply not necessary for all parties to FUIs to be legally represented since the procurator fiscal already has a duty to bring forward evidence about the circumstances of the death. I'll bring uh, Joanne Lamont. Joanne Lamont. I wonder if you would accept that many, many people in our constituencies feel that they are very, very poorly served by the fatal accident inquiry system, feel they are entirely excluded, have no confidence in the prosecution service, and what you are saying there is we don't have to look at this, everything is OK. In fact, the real problem is people are not able to engage when they have got concerns about how their rights are been represented. Surely the proposal in this amendment addresses that? Minister. I, I, I listen to the point that, that Joanne Lamont makes. I would just really point out we're having a bill here on the back of Lord Cullen's review to reform the, league, the uh, fatal accident inquiry process and also the innovation of the milestone charter or family charter as dubbed uh, in the pro for the purpose of the Act brought about both in terms of the line of questioning that Patricia Ferguson had taken and also the Solicitor General's um, own thoughts on this, does significantly move us forward in terms of making the fatal accident inquiry process much more uh, engaged with the families. And there's a formal process in which families will engage and communicate with throughout to ensure that they are uh, part of it and, and feel that they are having their points addressed by the Procurator Fiscal and the, the inquiry process. So, I hope that there, in passage of time, uh, Ms Lamont will see that the, the system is being reformed to make it more family friendly. Its, its main purpose is to establish the, the facts around the death and to prevent uh, further deaths happening, including I think that's all something we all share. But I want to reassure the member that the, uh, the, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service are doing everything they can to try and make the, the, the process more uh, aligned with the family's interests as well and make sure that they do consult with families on the line of questioning. In terms of the, um, uh, the change that, that might be proposed as a result of Patricia Ferguson's amendments, this would be at the expense of, as I say, the fundamental principles of both the system of FEIs and legal aid, and it would force us to look at alternative controls on legal aid. However, this is not just a, about a question about effect on legal aid. One of the key aims of the bill, something I would hope would be shared across the chamber, is to make FEIs less adversarial. Funding legal representation to raise similar concerns and questions which will be covered by the Procurator Fiscal in the public interest uh, would achieve the exact opposite in some circumstances. If it were to become the case that all parties at FEIs were legally represented, regardless of need, then such inquiries would inevitably become more adversarial, longer and expensive, with a potentially more adversarial nature and lengthier FEIs being the key considerations here. These concerns were highlighted in consultation responses by those involved in the running of FEIs. The Sheriff's Association said that, and I quote, it's only where there is a, a conflict of interest between the procurator fiscal and the next of kin that there should be a necessity for separate representation. That is a matter that should be explored and determined fully by Scottish Legal Aid Board before legal aid is granted, unquote. Lord Gill, in his consultation response while serving as Lord President, argued that increased legal aid for families of the deceased would lead to questions at FEIs becoming about blame, which are for civil litigation instead of about ascertaining the circumstances and causes of death. He also stated that, and I quote, the allowance of legal aid would negate the priorities of economy and expeditiousness that the proposals of the bill should achieve. Lord Carloway said in a letter to me only yesterday, and I quote, there is no substantial reason why those seeking legal aid for representation at an FEI should be subject to less arduous financial tests than other applicants in other situations. It's difficult to justify a more lenient regime for the former than for, say, a victim or a, of a road traffic accident who has suffered injuries of maximum severity, unquote. And he went on to say, uh, quote, uh, should family members be routinely represented, the inquiry risks losing its essential inquisitorial character and acquiring an unhelpful and inappropriate and quite possibly prolonged adversarial focus. Minister, I'd be grateful if you could begin to conclude. I, I will, uh, Presiding Officer. I believe our goal to make FEIs less adversarial is the right one. We should do what we can to avoid making FEIs more adversarial and creating greater difficulty in finding the truth to prevent the recurrence of death. And in doing so, I believe it is important to preserve the principles underpinning the legal aid system. I urge members to support Amendment 13 and reject Amendment 1. Thank you. Margaret Mitchell to be followed by Roger Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I supported, as did the majority of the Justice Committee, the provisions of legal aid for the bereaved 
families in fatal accidents in fatal accident inquiries under the terms of Patricia Ferguson's amendment at stage two, which I considered was proportionate and balanced. The key point here is that the Crown and Procurator Fiscal represents the public interest. It does not represent specifically the interests of relatives. It is therefore only right and fair that legal aid should be available to ensure sure that those interests are represented. This was, after all, another of the recommendations not included in the bill, uh, but made by Lord Cullen. So, if the government uses its parliamentary majority to remove this provision, it will further fuel the view that the grave concerns about the absence of checks and balances in the decision-making of this SNP majority government are well founded. Roger Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I've listened to the debate with some interest. One matter that still puzzles me slightly about the opposition is that we had Lord Cullen in the Justice Committee at stage one, and nobody asked him a question on this very issue. Um, I accept it came in at stage two, but he wasn't asked. And if this was an important issue, which, is, which the government hadn't accepted from his report, one would have anticipated the opposition would want to have questioned him on it. But it didn't take place. Patricia Ferguson has quite rightly referred to the bits in his report which touched on this matter. But what she didn't say after she said that the procurator fiscal is independent of any party, including the relatives, and should not be regarded as a representative at the FAI, he or she is entitled to decline to put questions for the relatives. But Lord Cullen went on to point out, I note that the Crown Office state in their guidance that, where necessary, the Procurator of Fiscal will indicate to the relatives that it is unlikely that he or she will be able adequately to represent their interests and concerns at the inquiry, and that separate representation is considered appropriate. I think that's the key. We've heard also from the, 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 the Minister about Lord Carloway's comments about the number of times when the issues between the family and the Procurator of Fiscal don't diverge. Clearly, where they do diverge, there should be a, a, an opportunity to obtain legal aid. But with the Milestone Charter, I would hope that those situations where people feel that they have been deprived of that opportunity are far fewer and went between. I've just now finished. Yeah. I'm, af I've, I've, I'm afraid yeah, the member's now, indicated that he's finished his speech. I therefore call Patricia Ferguson to wind up and indicate if you intend to press or withdraw, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm slightly confused by Roderick Campbell's uh, contribution, I have to say, because in actual fact, uh, the whole point of having stage two is so that matters that haven't been dealt with at stage one can be brought up. I don't know if Mr Campbell is arguing that perhaps we just shouldn't have stage two at all. But in addition, the quote that he read out from Lord Cullen's very good report on FAIs says, and I'll read it again for the avoidance of doubt, that if in the case where the Procurator Fiscal can't represent the families, it is unlikely that he or she will be able adequately to represent their interests and concerns at the inquiry, and that separate representation is considered appropriate. Yes, and we need the money to pay for it. Families who are in this situation will not always have resources to fall back on that will allow them to do that. But what always seems to me to be very strange about all of this is that the qualifications for legal aid for an FAI are at the moment the same as for any other piece of civil litigation. And in that case, you have to be able to identify probable cause. It seems odd to me to apply the concept of probable cause to an FAI because it isn't, as the Minister said, litigation. It's not something in which parties join in a piece of litigation. So that seems to me to be a very bizarre attitude to take to this whole thing. Now, the Minister referred to the Charter, which I very much welcome. But the point of the Charter is that the Ministers now accept that families need more information and require to be kept informed, then surely they must also have the right to be considered to have an interest in an FAI, an interest that will only be meaningful if they are represented. And the Charter does not provide I'll be happy to, Minister. Minister? I, I'm, I'm grateful to the member taking intervention. I, I, I do accept the point she is making about the need for families to be, to be represented where there's perhaps a difference of, of approach being taken uh, by the Procurator Fiscal to that which they would wish. When it comes to probable cause and reasonable, reasonableness kick in, that does allow families where they have a, rel a relevant interest in the FEI to get... It's just about demonstrating they have a relevant interest rather than someone who doesn't have an interest 
being represented in the inquiry. So it's, as I, I gave examples of uh, someone who has a relative who dies in prison, but uh, very, very likely get legal aid because of the, um, the difficulties that they face losing a loved one in, in a prison situation. So that's just an example of how probable cause is demonstrated and reasonable tests. Reasonable tests. Patricia tests Ferguson. I, 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 think, I think I'm right, but I'll stand corrected if I'm not. Presiding officer, deaths in custody already automatically get civil legal aid for the families to be represented at fatal accident inquiries. And the point about this is that the families who want to be represented in a fatal accident inquiry won't necessarily know that there is even an issue about probable cause until there's some way into the FAI process. So how can you then cope with that? Or is the Minister saying that we're going to willy-nilly halt fatal accident inquiries to allow the uh, Scottish Legal Aid Board to reconsider a case before it actually resumes? No, I've, I've heard what the Minister had to say and it wasn't particularly helpful, I have to say. But, well, if, Order, you, please. if you give me a minute to just respond to what's already been said, the, the Charter itself does not provide for the Procurator Fiscal to represent the families. It does make it easier for the families to get information through the process, but it doesn't allow them to act on behalf of those people. At the moment and in the future, the Procurator Fiscal will represent the public interest, and that's a different thing. The Minister can intervene. Minister. Grateful to the member for taking intervention. I, I think when it comes to the public interest, there may be a good alignment between the public interest and the interest of the family in many cases. Where there isn't, what I'm saying is legal aid would be, there's a, a very high chance, subject to financial eligibility tests, as with other forms of legal aid, that relatives will have access to legal aid to take forward a line of questioning that might not be taken forward by the Procurator Fiscal. So I just want to give reassurance to the member that uh, as the arrangements already apply, but they'll be strengthened by the, the family charter, there's a process to ensure that the Procurator Fiscal discusses the kinds of questions that the family would like to have heard. Trisha Ferguson, if you could begin to draw to Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm actually close to finishing. I would just say to the Minister, I know he's trying to be helpful, but I'm afraid if you think about the process, that just will not work. Family members will not know that there is going to be a difference between their interest and the public interest until they see the line of questioning that goes forward. And I would just say to the Minister, none of us want to see FAIs being adversarial. But in my view, and it's only my view, I'm not quoting from anyone here, FAIs are likely to be more adversarial if people haven't got the right to representation. It stands to reason. It seems to me that it's a basic principle, presiding officer, that family members, bereaved people who are having to go through the trauma of a fatal accident inquiry, should be assisted by the state to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I presume that you are going to press your amendment, Ms Ferguson. Thank you. In which case, the question is that amendment one be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a one minute division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number one is as follows. Yes, 45. No, 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. And I now call amendment 13 in the name of the Minister, which has already been debated with amendment one. And I ask the Minister to move formally, please. Formally moved. The question then is that amendment 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. 
32nd Division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 13 is yes 61, no 46. There are no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to. That then brings us to group four, Sheriff's determination and recommendations. And I call amendment 14 in the name of the Minister, which is grouped with amendments 15, 16, 17, 18 and 19. And I ask the Minister to move amendment 14 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This group of amendments are technical government amendments regarding the Sheriff's determination and recommendations at the conclusion of a fatal accident inquiry. Amendment 14 removes the requirement for the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service to provide a copy of a Sheriff's determination to any person who pays uh, the specified fee. This is no longer required because all determinations will be published under Section 26, Subsection 1A by the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, so interested persons will be able to obtain the determinations online. SCTS can provide printouts or alternative formats for cases where an interested person cannot access the website, for example, under Quality Act uh, duties. Uh, amendments 15 and 16 are to tidy up a minor drafting issue identified in the new section 27A, which was inserted by an amendment uh, by Patricia Ferguson with Scottish Government support. Uh, Ms Ferguson's amendment placed a duty on Scottish ministers to publish an annual report on the number of responses to sheriff's recommendations made in the determination at the conclusion of an FEI during a financial year. These amendments remove some potentially confusing words to make it clear that responses received in the eight-week period following the end of the financial year are to be included in the annual report for that financial year. This does not alter the policy proposed by Patricia Ferguson, and I have shared these amendments with uh, Patricia Ferguson as a courtesy. Amendment 17 relates to what happens when the Lord Advocate decides that further proceedings should be initiated, either by reopening an inquiry or, exceptionally, by holding a fresh inquiry. In the interests of transparency, the Bill does not provide for the withdrawal of the original determination from publication. It should, however, be made clear by means of the publication of a notice that the original determination has been set aside. Amendment 17 ensures that at the point the Sheriff makes an order for further proceedings, Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service must publish a notice explaining that the determination has been set aside. An interested person going to the STTS website will therefore see all of the relevant information together. Amendments 18 and 19 are technical amendments to section 33 relating to further inquiry proceedings. They relate to where a recommendation was made in the original determination by the Sheriff, but a recommendation in the same terms is not made in the new determination. In such circumstances, SCATS must withdraw from publication responses to such recommendations and any notices published in relation to them. Amendment 19 requires SCTS to withdraw from publication notices which state that part of a response to a recommendation has been withheld from publication in addition to those published which state that the whole of a response has been withheld or that no response was given. Amendment 18 is consequential to Amendment 19, and I move Amendment 14. Thank you. Thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Thank you very much. And I now call Amendments 15, 16, 17, 18 and 19, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move Amendments 15 to 19 on block, please. Formally moved. Does any member object to a single question being put in Amendments 15 to 19? As no member does, the question is that Amendments 15 to 19 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. I now move to Group 5 and call Amendment 20 in the name of the Minister. Group with Amendments 21 to 35. Minister, to move Amendments 20 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, amendments 20 to 35 are highly technical in nature. Uh, amendments 21 and 22, together with Amendment 34 mentioned uh, below, are the key substantive amendments of this group. They add Section 34, Subsection 6, and Schedule 1 to the list of sections that come into force the day after Royal Assent. This is to permit the Scottish Civil Justice Council to begin work early in the new year <coughs> on drafting rules for FEIs to replace the Fatal Accidents and Sudden Deaths Inquiry Procedure, Scotland Rules 1977. The SCJC currently has no powers to do so. 
Amendment 34 removes paragraph 2 of Schedule 1 to the Bill, and this removes the transitional arrangement for the Scottish Ministers to make regulations for FAI rules before the SCJC takes on the responsibility. Amendment 20 is consequential on Amendment 34. Amendment 31 inserts a new paragraph into Section 4, Subsection 3 of the SCJC Act to make it clear that the Court of Session's power to make inquiry rules is not prejudiced by the SCJC's specific statutory function of preparing draft FAI rules. Amendments 23 to 30, 32, 33 and 35 are technical remodelling of existing provisions which do not have any substantive effect. They are needed because the Scottish Civil Justice Council will now take on the role of drafting FEI rules before it takes on the role of drafting rules for the Scottish Tribunals. Amendment 35 makes some minor consequential tidying up changes to the Tribunals Act. Uh, I move Amendment 20. Thank you very much. There's no member asked to speak. Um, do you have anything further to add in winding up, Minister? Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 20 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Thank you. We are. So I call Amendments 21 to 35, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated, and invite the Minister to move Amendments 21 to 35 on block, please. Formally moved on block. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put in Amendments 21 to 35? And as no member does, the question is that Amendments 21 to 35 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We are, and that ends consideration of amendments. And we'll now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 15113 in the name of Paul Wheelhouse on the inquiries into fatal accidents and sudden deaths, etc. Scotland Bill. Before I invite the Minister to open the debate, I call on the Cabinet Secretary to signify Crown assent to the Bill. I now call Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson for Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, for the purposes of Rule Point 11 of the Standing Orders, I wish to advise the Department that Her Majesty, having been informed of the purports of the inquiries into the fatal accident and sudden deaths, etc., Scotland Bill, has consented to her prerogatives and interests, so far as they are affected by the Bill, at the disposal of the Parliament for the purposes of the Bill. Many thanks. And so... I now call on Paul Wheelhouse to speak to and move the motion. And before I do, before you rise, Minister, I invite all members who wish to take part in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. Minister, ten minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am delighted to open this stage three debate on inquiries into fatal accidents and sudden deaths, etc. Scotland Bill. The law relating to the investigation of sudden, suspicious and unexplained death is different in Scotland to the rest of the UK. Countries which follow the common law system, such as England, have coroners. Uh, in countries where there is a tradition of the civil law, in other words, law deriving from Roman law, sudden and suspicious deaths are investigated by the procurator, whose other duties include the preparation of criminal cases for prosecution. Scotland is historically a country where the civil law has been followed, and so the duty of investigating sudden and unnatural deaths has been handed down over a number of centuries to the procurator fiscal. The concept of the fatal accident inquiry has its roots in the reforms of the 19th century, which quite rightly demanded the improvement of social and working conditions. The procurator fiscal thus first became the, the guardian of the public interest in relation to industrial and occupational deaths in order to ensure the impartial investigation of fatal industrial accidents with a view to presenting the evidence to a sheriff. Later, the procurator fiscal was charged with investigating any sudden or suspicious death in Scotland in relation to which there was a public interest in exposing and examining the, the uh, facts of the death. There have been a number of pieces of legislation on fatal accident inquiries, and the most recent, the Fatal Accidents and Sudden Deaths Inquiry Scotland Act 1976, has served Scotland for nearly 40 years. It is right that the law should now be reformed and modernised, and I should like to pay tribute to Lord Cullen, who carried out a most thorough review of the legislation which has brought us to this point. There is a reason why I have sought to put the system of death investigation and of fatal accident inquiries in Scotland into context and to explain its historical derivation. Procurators fiscal investigate some 5,500 sudden, suspicious or unexplained deaths every year. Clearly, many of these investigations will result in criminal proceedings. In many cases, the fiscal will conclude that no further investigations or inquiry is necessary. Only around 50 to 60 cases per annum proceed to a full fatal accident inquiry before a sheriff. The Scottish Government firmly believes that this system incorporates and permits a necessary and beneficial degree of flexibility. Cases which have led to public concern will almost certainly lead to an FEI before a sheriff, while those which do not, by and large, will not. 
One of the strengths of vesting all death investigation powers in a single public officer is that when homicide has been excluded, the prosecutor's duty is not at, the, at an end. Whereas if suspicious circumstances emerge in the course of investigating what had appeared to be an expected death, the prosecutor is already aware of the circumstances. Deaths as a result of a, an accident in the course of employment and deaths in legal custody will automatically result in mandatory FEIs. Under the bill, deaths of children in secure accommodation and deaths in police custody, irrespective of the location of the death, will also now result in mandatory inquiries. In all other cases, discretion is given to the Lord Advocate and the Crown Office to decide whether an FEI is required in the public interest. It is right that they should do so, since the Crown will first have to establish whether there has been any behaviour in relation to the death which merits criminal prosecution. It is only after that decision has been taken that consideration will be given to the need for an FEI where it is not mandatory. Lord Gill, the former Lord President, indicated in his evidence before the Justice Committee that it was right that the Crown Office should exercise discretion rather than the law becoming too inflexible. This would lead to many FEIs being held from which no lessons could be learned, yet the bereaved family or families would suffer the distress of a public examination of the circumstances of the death of their loved one. Under the bill, it will now be possible for the Lord Advocate to judge whether it would be in the public interest for an FEI to be held into the death of a person normally resident in Scotland who dies or is killed abroad. In coming to that decision, the Lord Advocate will have to take into account whether there has already been an adequate investigation of the death in the country where it took place. He or she will also have to consider whether there is a realistic prospect that an investigation in Scotland by the Crown Office will be able to properly establish the circumstances of the death, given that they will have to rely on liaison with and the cooperation of the legal and government authorities in the country in which the death took place. Nevertheless, the government believes that this is a major advance in the law of death investigation in Scotland, particularly as it will be possible to hold an FEI without the body being repatriated to this country. That is still a requirement for a coroner's inquest to be held in such circumstances in the rest of the UK. The requirement for the repatriation of the body was removed from the bill at the suggestion of the Justice Committee, to whom I extend my thanks for their thoughtful and thorough consideration of the bill. There is therefore now parity in the bill in terms of a death occurring on the Scottish mainland in the offshore North Sea oil and gas area or abroad. I should add that the system in Scotland is quite different from that under the coroners uh, in the rest of the UK. Under the coroner system, the coroner is responsible for the investigation of the death or deaths. But the coroner also presides over the inquest. In Scotland, the procurator fiscal investigates the death. But then, if any FEI is mandatory or is ordered by the Lord Advocate, the fiscal will, represent, uh, will present the evidence to a full judicial inquiry before a sheriff. We believe that this system combines and embodies the necessary elements of effective investigation, separation of powers and judicial independence to authoritatively determine the circumstances of death and any precautions which might have uh, been taken and which should be taken in the future to prevent deaths in similar circumstances. The bill contains new provisions which require participants at FEIs to whom a sheriff has directed a recommendation to respond, setting out how they propose to implement the recommendation or if they do not intend to comply, why not? Patricia Ferguson brought forward an amendment at stage two which requires Scottish ministers to produce an annual report on responses to recommendations. Taken as a package, we believe that the proposals on, re on requiring responses to sheriff recommendations and the annual report will provide a transparent record of what has happened in relation to those recommendations. It will also highlight whether participants have responded to those recommendations, though if the experience under a similar system for coroner's inquests is a guide, very high response rates may be expected. Patricia Ferguson also laid an amendment at stage two which provides statutory underpinning for the family liaison charter, which the Solicitor General promised during evidence at stage one. The charter will keep bereaved families fully informed of the progress of a death investigation and the likelihood of criminal proceedings or the potential for a fatal accident inquiry. Patricia Ferguson did, of course, bring forward her own member's bill on fatal accident inquiries. Although she chose to withdraw it at stage one, I think it's appropriate at this point to acknowledge and pay tribute to all of the hard work which she has devoted to the various issues surrounding uh, death investigations and FEIs. And I would like to thank her for the collaborative way in which she has engaged with the government in relation to the bill. Elaine Murray has laid an amendment on trade union participation at FEIs at stage two. The Scottish Government accepted the amendment, subject to amending the provision to ensure that it properly reflected the policy intention. And I'm similarly grateful to Elaine Murray for discussing that with me. And as a result, we've now amended the provision to ensure it means that bodies similar to trade unions who represent workers who are not permitted to join trade unions will be able to participate at FEIs. 
I should also like to pay tribute to Flight Lieutenant uh, James Jones, who drew to the attention of the Justice Committee the anomaly that deaths of service personnel in the course of their duties in Scotland do not at present automatically result in a fatal accident inquiry, though a discretionary inquiry may be held. This fact was not raised by Lord Cullen in his review, nor was the matter brought up during the Government's consultation on its legislative proposals. Uh, it is a credit to the system of evidence taken by the Justice Committee that this issue was identified during its deliberations. This matter will now be progressed by means of a Section 104 order under the Scotland Act 1998, which will be brought forward at the Westminster Parliament as this issue en uh, engages the reservation of defence matters and the armed forces. I indica uh, indicated during the Stage 1 debate that we have received in principle agreement from the UK Government for this change. Uh, the Scottish Government will continue to work with the UK Government to put in place the necessary order next year. This bill is not the end of reforms of the system of fatal accident inquiries. In addition to the Section 104 order to which I have already referred, the Scottish Civil Justice Council will be preparing rules for FEIs under Section 34 of the bill, which will complement and supplement its provisions. These rules will provide the kind of comprehensive, self-contained set of rules which Lord Cullen recommended were necessary for FEIs. In future, it will therefore not be necessary to supplement the fairly sparse existing rules for FEIs with rules which were written for adversarial civil litigation and which may not lend themselves to an inquisitorial fact-finding process. The involvement of the Scottish Civil Justice Council will ensure that the new draft bespoke rules for FEIs benefit from structured, coordinated stakeholder input. Rules will cover matters such as preliminary hearings, which will now be the norm for FEIs, the agreement so far as possible of uncontroversial evidence before the start of an FEI, greater case management powers for sheriffs in line with the general thrust of the reforms under the Courts Reform Scotland Act 2014, and new provisions for further inquiry proceedings where new evidence comes to light. The intention is that the new Act, the rules and the Section 104 order will all be commenced at the same time. As it will take some months to work up, uh, suitable and comprehensive rules under the Act. It is not anticipated that this will be until later in 2016. To conclude, the Scottish Government's bill provides for a coherent, proportionate, modernised system of fatal accident inquiries fit for the 21st century. It seeks to provide what Lord Cullen desired, practical measures for a system for inquiry that is effective, efficient and fair, and we believe that it is what the bill does, and we hope that legislation is able to serve for an even longer than the 1976 Act. Presiding officer, I commend the motion in my name and ask members to support the passage of this bill. Excellent. Very nice. And I call on Dr Elaine Murray. Seven minutes, please, Dr Murray. Tight for time. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Fatal accidents into the circumstances of a death are undertaken in the public interest, as we were hearing, in order to determine the time, place and cause, and to establish whether lessons can be learned to prevent similar fatalities in the future. They are intended to be inquisitorial rather than adversarial, and they do not attempt to allocate guilt in a criminal sense. And I think we are all in agreement that they should continue uh, to operate in that manner. The current legislation has been recognised to be inadequate for some time. As long ago as March 2008, shortly after Lord Cullen had been asked to conduct his review uh, of the fatal accident process, a debate was held in this Parliament on the inadequacies of the, of the system, during which uh, members of Parliament were informed by the direct knowledge uh, of the experiences of their constituents. Nine of Patricia Ferguson's constituents died when ICU stockline plastic fa factory exploded in May 2004, and it was because of their frustrations with the delays in the system. A judge-led public inquiry was not held for four years that Ms Ferguson introduced her own member's bill, the Inquiry into Death Scotland Bill to Parliament in November last year. She had induced, uh, introduced draft proposals for consultation in August 2013. Lord Cullen had reported his findings in 2009. The Scottish Government responded in 2011, but did not bring forward its own legislation until after Patricia Ferguson's bill had been introduced. And it may seem cynical, but I do wonder whether this bill would be with, with us today if Patricia Ferguson had not already started the bowling with her own member's bill. Nevertheless, having been introduced in March this year, the bill has progressed fairly rapidly. As members know, Patricia Ferguson agreed to withdraw her own bill and to work with the Government on amendments. Her bill had sought to introduce time limits uh, in which certain decisions should be taken and family members informed. During the stage one evidence taking, the Solicitor General had advised the committee of her intention to drop a charter, advising what bereaved families could expect with regard to communication. A copy of the draft charter was circulated to Justice Committee members over the summer. Uh, Patricia, at stage two, in agreement with the government, submitted an amendment which set this on a statutory basis. She and the Scottish Government also agreed an amendment which required ministers to prepare an annual report on Sheriff's recommendations relating to FAIs, and some clarifying amendments have been agreed this afternoon. 
I mentioned both these amendments because it was one of the Justice Committee's recommendations that this bill be amended to include some of the additional aspects of Patricia Ferguson's bill. Now, I don't know that the bill even is amended. In fact, I do know that the bill even as amended doesn't address all the issues, issues which Patricia Ferguson had hoped to cover in her bill, but she will be speaking in the open debate. She will no doubt pass comment on those issues. The bill doesn't address all Lord Cullen's recommendations either. Uh, and it may be that the future uh, plans of the, of, of the government may bring some of those things into effect later on. However, I do believe that this bill is an improvement on current uh, legislation and therefore it is welcome. I am, of course, pleased that my own modest stage two amendment was accepted. Uh, this bill now gives representatives of trade unions, of which the de deceased was a member at the time of their death, the automatic right to attend a fatal, fatal accident inquiry, giving trade unions parity with a deceased employer. My original amendment, as I said, uh, made reference to staff associations, as I was keen that bodies such as the Scottish Police Federation and the Association of Police Superintendents should have the same entitlement to attend if one of their members dies. And I'm grateful to the Scottish Government for improving the way this is expressed through their Stage uh, 3 amendments today. The Government amended the Bill at Stage 2 to enable an FAI to be held when a death has occurred abroad, even if the body cannot be repatriated. There are circumstances such as deaths at sea when retrieval of the body is not possible. That in itself, whether there is not the possibility of a burial or cremation ceremony, is very upsetting for families without also debarring them from the possibility of a, that a fatal accident inquiry could be held in the public interest. Flight Lieutenant James Jones uh, brought forward to us at stage one the issue of service per personnel who die while in service in Scotland. Uh, and I am pleased that this is being brought forward uh, to the UK Parliament and hopefully there will be a resolution uh, of that issue. And I too am grateful to Flight Lieutenant Jones for actually drawing our attention to that issue. Patricia Ferguson also introduced an amendment which had the majority support of the committee, which ensured that families could be legally represented, represented through the complexities of a fatal accident inquiry by removing the re reasonableness test for the eligibility for legal uh, aid. We are indeed very disappointed that the Scottish Government chose to delete this amendment today, particularly as the amendment continued to have the support of all the opposition parties in this chamber. Also, especially after Ms. Ferguson's erudite explanation of how the need for families to be confident of receiving legal aid at the commencement of an, the FAI process, I think it is now notable that families of those who die in prison are treated differently in this regard from those who die at work or, or indeed families uh, whose relatives die in the street. The Com Committee on Majority Vote had also amended the, the bill at stage two to implement one of Lord Cullen's recommendations, which had not been in the government's bill, to make uh, fatal. Uh, accident inquiries are mandatory where people die in compulsory mental health detention. We, at the time, this had been supported by third sector uh, organisations such as NABLE uh, in their submissions to Lord Cullen's review. Uh, and we had also been told that uh, coroner's inquiries were mandatory in these circumstances in England and Wales. However, several organisations, including health professionals and, crucially, mental health patients and their families, subsequently wrote both to the government and MSPs asking that these amendments be deleted to, from the bill and to revert to the original wording which provides for discretionary FAIs in these circumstances. I said, as I said during the uh, amendment stage, my correspondence yesterday with Enable indicated that they too were content with this change so long as adequately uh, assurances were given that the review required by Section 37 of the Mental Health, Health Act into the investigation of deaths of patients who at the time of death were detained in hospital under mental health law would be progressed as a, man, a matter of urgency. We have today heard that the, the order to do that has, already, has been laid yesterday uh, and that the uh, review will be undertaken as soon as is possible. And I think actually it was well worthwhile amending the bill at stage two in order to be able to achieve that sort of reassurance today. And I know that everybody will be grateful uh, for that. Despite our, the, our disappointment over the deletion of Patricia Ferguson's amendment on legal aid, we do believe that the original bill has been improved by comparison with Patricia's bill and by the subsequent amendments which were agreed at stages two and stages three, and we will be supporting it in this evening's vote. Many thanks. I now call on Margaret Mitchell. Up to five minutes, please, Ms Mitchell. Yeah. Uh, sorry, thank you. Um, 
Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, I begin my contribution to today's Stage 3 debate on inquiries into fatal accident and sudden death Scotland Bill by acknowledging Patricia Ferguson's significant involvement in this legislative process following the withdrawal of her own bill and her cooperation with the Scottish Government at Stage 2. I also thank the witnesses and stakeholders for their insightful evidence which has informed the committee's scrutiny of the bill. 30 years after the system of fatal accident inquiries was enacted, it's not surprising significant form and modernisation was required. Consequently, in 2009, Lord Cullen's review of the law governing fatal accident inquiries made a number of important recommendations, many of which are contained in the bill. However, during its stage one scrutiny, the Justice Committee identified a number of weaknesses in the bill which needed to be addressed at stage two. For example, a common criticism from bereaved families was the long delays before the commencement of inquiries, inquiries aggravated by patchy communication from the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Office. Concern was therefore expressed that the Scottish Government did not include this in the bill. Lord Cullen's recommendation of an early hearing um, should therefore um, have been included, especially as these early hearings would have required the Procurator Fiscal not to keep relatives informed, uh, not only to keep relatives informed of the progress of the investigation, but also crucially to focus attention on ensuring the fatal accidents were held as quickly as possible. However, following the, co the commitment of the Solicitor General to produce a milestone charter outlining what families can expect from the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service in relation to the timings of investigations and decision making, the committee came to the view that early hearings were no longer deemed necessary. Furthermore, in relation to fatal accident inquiries into deaths abroad, the Justice Committee questioned the requirement that the body must be repatriated to Scotland for the fatal accident inquiry to be heard, taking into account evidence that occasionally exceptional circumstances would render this impossible. The Scottish Government amended the bill accordingly at stage two. Turning now to the stage two amendments on legal aid for families and amendments to the mandatory inquiries with the Lord Advocates opt out for individuals detained on a compulsory basis under the mental health legislation. These were recommendations from Lord Cullen, not included, but voted for by a majority of the Justice Committee at stage two. And I still consider that these amendments for mental health detainees ensured the right balance was struck between ensuring that the mandatory FEI was not carried out unnecessarily and ensuring that the deceased rights had been protected and, in, and the amendment on legal aid recognised that the Lord Advocate does not represent the interests of the families but rather the public interest. Today the Scottish Government has overturned both these amendments and two consequences flow from this. Firstly, the total absence of checks and balances in the decision making of this SNP majority government has been laid bare and this continues to, just, uh, to justifiably be an issue of grave concern. We heard from the member and we heard from other contributions before uh, that somehow uh, it's not a proper democratic process. It is a proper democratic process and, and a government cannot accept everything that the opposition would. If it did, it would be an opposition bill. What's the point being in government if you cannot direct some part of the legislation? Some part approves, some part you don't. And I can remind the member that she has herself a member's bill which you accepted at stage two. Point made. Thanks so much. Margaret Mitchell. The point is that there are, I think, five subject committees with SNP have no seven out of nine subject committees with SNP has a majority in the in the there are checks and balances, um, and I take the sedentary point from Ms. Graham in the um, in the Westminster government, and that's been proven quite recently with decisions from the House of Lords. The point is there are no checks and balances on this majority government because we were never supposed to have one, and thus we've got the despicable decision today on Patricia. Members Americans just closing. Aid. Can I just close by saying there is no doubt that individuals who are detained under mental health legislation 
population are amongst the most vulnerable in society, yet today the SNP government has ensured that they are not afforded the same protections as criminals who die in custody. So, presiding officer, whilst the bill uh, generally will have a positive impact on bereaved families' experiences of the FEI system in Scotland, I believe the Scottish Government can take little comfort or pride in how it has discriminated against these vulnerable mental health detainees. Thank you very much. We now move to the open debate. I call on Christian Allard. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Allard. Thank you, President Officer. And yes, you know, I, I did make the point, and I would like to, to, to make it again. It's very, very important that you understand the strength of this parliament in this place, particularly when we see that members in the opposition can bring forward uh, members' bills, and which is fantastic. It's a very great thing to do. Not only this, and I will come back du du during my contribution, a person can come and give evidence in a committee and change the bill itself. Which is quite incredible. It's not only uh, opposition members who can contribute uh, to, 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 to drafting of a bill, but people who come who give evidence in uh, a committee can do that as well. And I talk about uh, um, retired uh, flight uh, Lieutenant Jones, of course. Uh, but as a member of the, of the committee, I'm delighted to see this afternoon the passage of another of many bills we are uh, scrutinizing. Uh, this year uh, in the Justice Committee. Uh, and I would like to thank the members and the clerks, and we will be delighted to know that uh, uh, that's the second of the stage three bills we've done this week. Uh, and this bill will modernize the fatal accident inquiry process and will make it effective, efficient, and fair. Uh, follow, uh, following recent event, it is right, presenting officer, uh, that I shall remind this chamber that the interest of the families in the fatal accident inquiry is to ascertain the circumstances and the cause of death. It must be the primary concern of us all not to confuse a fatal accident inquiry with procedures in civil courts where any question of blame are to be addressed. And that's very, very important that we see that all through. And I do think that at stage one and at stage two and now at stage three, we have some willing of some members who wants to maybe go to a more adversarial uh, uh, kind of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of inquiry, and I don't think it will help the process, and it will not help the family to understand more uh, ab about, uh, about the process. There are two things I would uh, quickly uh, uh, like to say today. Uh, Ellen Murray did speak about them already. It's first of all, uh, the, uh, the fact that the first jurisdiction in the UK, uh, Scotland, is here to, uh, to allow inquiries of death uh, occurred abroad uh, with all the, repatri the repatriation of the body of the deceased. But what I would like to say about that, and to make sure that families understand, it's very important that the public out there understand, only in exceptional circumstances. And I repeat, in exceptional uh, circumstances only. And it's very important to make that point. Uh, but uh, like the Minister said, we have gone beyond the practice uh, in England and Wales, and quite rightly so, I would say. And I, I can refer to the Minister again uh, when he said that it's very important that advance that has possibility should exist, particularly as that is not the case in England and Wales. I very much welcome this presenting officer and the reassurance that will give to many people in Scotland, uh, people who are working abroad uh, in, uh, in challenging conditions and in difficult conditions sometimes, are particularly thinking about the North East of Scotland, a lot of all workers are, are, are working all, all across the world, and it's very important they've got that. And uh, to, to finish off, I would like to talk about, about retired flight, uh, Lieutenant James Jones, and when he came and gave evidence, and it's fantastic to see that one person can make so much difference, and I very much look forward uh, to, the, to the root of the order on Section 104 of the Scotland Act 1998 that emerged through this bill, uh, that will ensure uh, that uh, those who risk their lives for us can be reassured at appropriate inquest in the future, particularly in light of those days when we are asking them again and again to make the ultimate sacrifice overseas. I would like to thank again uh, retired flight uh, Lieutenant James Jones for coming to the committee as without his efforts this may not have been possible. Uh, the lessons close, of the past uh, have been learned and I look forward uh, to a fair settlement for service personnel in Scotland. Presenting officer. Thanks very much. I now call on Patricia Ferguson to be followed by Alison McInnes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, this afternoon, when we pass this bill, as we will, with uh, Labour support, we will make some significant changes to the FAI system in this country. 
but I can't help but observe that we've missed the opportunity to make some radical and important changes to the FAI system at the same time. Lord Cullen's review ordered by the Scottish Government was a good one, but it didn't go quite far enough for me, if I'm being perfectly honest, as colleagues probably already know. But it obviously went too far for the Scottish Government. As members know, I introduced my own bill, and I should say at this point that I'm very grateful to the clerks, to the Justice Committee, for their assistance with that and to the legislation team in the Parliament, as well as to Patrick Maguire of Thomson Solicitors, who was most helpful in that regard. But I would also want to thank very much the members of the Justice Committee who were very helpful to me and very accommodating and who gave very careful consideration to the bill I proposed. As members know, the uh, decision of the Justice Committee was that the best vehicle to take forward some of these issues was the government's bill and they urged that we should cooperate to take forward uh, the issues uh, that were uh, being discussed. I think that the areas where we agreed, the Charter, will make a difference to families. I think it will make it easier for them to understand the process and it will make it easier for them to get information in advance of an FEI and hopefully through the process of an FEI too. And I think the annual report of the uh, recommendations made by sheriffs with regard to their consideration of fatal accident inquiries will also be important. And I'm glad that the government eventually agreed that that report should be laid before Parliament because I think it's important that we, if we're not going to do post-legislative scrutiny of bills like this, at least look at the outcomes that we do have uh, laid before us. I am very disappointed that the government didn't agree to accept the stage two amendment that I put through about civil legal aid. Uh, we've rehearsed uh, perhaps the debate around that one uh, enough this afternoon, but I do think that it is remarkable that those who perhaps uh, are involved in the death of someone in custody will still remain uh, having legal aid as they should, but bereaved families whose family member has perhaps died as a result of an accident at work will not necessarily have that guaranteed to them. And I think that this parliament has done those families a disservice today. I will say this, presiding officer, and um, others have referred to this already, but I do think that there is a very important question about scrutiny in this parliament. I'm not going to make a long or a, a big point of this, but I do think that when uh, all the opposition parties agree that there is a point that is worth pursuing and do so because they have a genuine concern and they have aired the issues and discussed the issues, that it is very sad that the Scottish Government chooses to use its majority to vote that down. I have no compunction about saying that I know that the amendment was only agreed at stage two because there isn't a government majority on that committee. And I'm very grateful to all those members who gave it careful consideration whether they voted for it then or today or not. As Elaine Murray quite rightly said, my interest in FAIs was sparked by the death of nine members of the community, I suppose we would call them, at the Stockline factory in my constituency, and of the terrible weight that they had for a fatal accident inquiry. I hope that the recommendations we've put through today and the bill that will emerge as a result of those deliberations make sure that families in the future do not have to have the experience that those nine families had over a prolonged period of four years. Thank you. Thanks so much. Now call on Alison McInnes to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you. Uh, the current legislation governing the fatal accident inquiry system is nearly 40 year, years old and it has been six years since Lord Cullen reported on his review into this matter. So I think we can all agree that this bill has been a long time coming. And I'm therefore pleased that we finally reached the home straight on reforming and modernising the FAI system. At the outset, I would once again like to praise Patricia Ferguson for the work she undertook and the tenacity that she showed um, and the professionalism as she um, undertook the work that ultimately led to the Scottish Government Bill. 
And the bill has introduced included a number of improvements to the FEI uh, system. The initial bill set out the requirement to hold a mandatory FEI for the death of a child in secure accommodation and deaths under police arrest. It allowed FEIs to be reopened if new evidence was found and required bodies that are affected by a sheriff's determination to formally respond, setting out what actions they have taken. And these are all welcome improvements. But as others have said, not all of Lord Cullum's recommendations were included. And in particular, I'm referring to the decision not to include deaths of people detained under mental health legislation within that mandatory category. That changed at stage two and has reverted earlier this afternoon during stage three amendments. And as I said earlier, I have concluded on balance that there is a more proportionate and less distressing way to proceed that involves reforming the whole system of notifications and investigations. But I do think the debate that it generated has been worthwhile, and I'm sure there is a greater understanding amongst all involved that a more rigorous and coherent system for investigating deaths of those detained for mental health reasons is required. Already an additional safeguard has come into place, meaning that all deaths of people detained under the Mental Health Scotland Act 2003 and the Criminal Procedure Act 1995 will end up on the Procurator Fiscal's desk for his attention. And I welcome the Minister's assurances this afternoon about the timetable for the review. I hope the review will pay particular attention to death by suicide while detained. At stage two, I pressed the Minister on whether it would be appropriate to extend the requirement to hold a mandatory FAI in two further categories. Firstly, as the result of a death of a child who was looked after by the state, even if they lived with their parents or guardians at the time of their death. And secondly, and, and, and a little niche area for patients with dementia who immediately before their death had received prolonged treatment using psychotropic medication. Because we know that that type of medication causes sedation, confusion and movement difficulty. And overuse of such drugs in such situations has been implicated in an increased risk of stroke. A number of organisations, including the Mental Welfare Commission, have raised concerns about the widespread use of those drugs in care home settings. And the most vulnerable people in our society do deserve our attention. I was pleased in both those instances to receive assurances from the Minister that attention was focused on those areas and I did not therefore press my amendments. I do welcome the Government's recognition of the need for a national child death review system to review the deaths of all children and young people, not just those in care. I understand that the work of the steering group to develop a model for that system is ongoing and I do look forward to hearing of its outcomes. I was also grateful to the Minister for acknowledging that the prolonged use of psychotropic medication for dementia patients is an issue that could also be explored in the wider review, and I will uh, continue to pursue that. As I said, Patricia Ferguson has been tenacious in her pursuit of improvements. Like her, I'm disappointed that her amendment on legal aid secured at Stage 2 has been removed this afternoon at Stage 3. But nevertheless, she can um, feel content that she has improved the initial bill. Fatal accident inquiries are held in the public interest, but behind every death there is a family, and those who knew and loved the deceased course, person, please. people who are seeking answers. And Ms Ferguson's amendments make sure they will be part of that process and will be kept informed. So overall, I support the bill, I support the changes it makes to the current systems, and we will support the bill at decision time. Thank you so much. Now I call on Christine Graham to be followed by John Finney. Uh, thank Four you, minutes. Deputy Presiding Officer. As a preliminary, let me say I hear rumblings about the SNP overall majority. For eight years in here, we had a Labour Liberal coalition majority, and I can't recall on any occasion, on any committee, I managed to get an amendment through where they had a majority on every single committee. So let's just park that one for a start, and there isn't an overall SNP majority on the Justice Committee. No, I'm going to proceed because I've heard enough about that. For eight years of it. Very much welcome this legislation and commend the work of members of the Justice Committee which has increased the relevance and potency of this bill. I congratulate Patricia Ferguson for much that she did in pursuing her own bill, most of which persuaded matters to change in the government's legislation. And indeed, this particular minister, who does listen and I think does collaborate where it's possible with other members who don't always agree. I want to turn to something that's already been mentioned, which is the death of service personnel. There was a very bizarre situation where if you're a Scottish service personnel who died abroad out with the UK, there could be a dis discretionary FAI. But if you died in Scotland in service, there wasn't. 
And in fact, there could be an inquiry in England, but nothing in Scotland. And to the best of my knowledge, the only FAI that's taken place involving service personnel in Scotland was a Muller Kintyre Chinook helicopter crash. And that was simply because there were some civilian people on that plane. Now, I think it's wonderful that the evidence to the committee we are now moving, and I congratulate Westminster, not often you'll hear that, for going to move a section 104 under the Scotland Act, which I know is mentioned in Schedule 2 of this bill. Not only do I think that's going to be welcomed by families, I think it will be welcomed by the larger Scottish community, but I have a question for the Minister. I'm looking for confirmation that this will apply to historic service personnel deaths in Scotland. I'm wondering if we've been able to have FEIs now that we've never had into incidents that took place. The other incident is death of Scottish residents abroad, which I think my colleague uh, Christian Allard referred to, where it just seemed again bizarre that you had to bring a mandatory to bring a body home to have a discretionary FEI. Obviously, there are circumstances where there will be no body to retrieve a loss at sea or other circumstances. So if it was possible to pursue a discretionary FAI without it, why not do it? So I'm glad that the government moved on that. I turn to Patricia Ferguson's bill, and much that she did persuaded movement in the government's legislation. Family liaison charter, very, very important. Uh, we had to, I think the idea of making the recommendations of the sheriff binding it was very attractive initially, but once you get into the detail of it, began to realise it had huge unintended consequences, not only from the parties that might have to be called to an FAI, widening its scope enormously. Let's say some widget was found to be faulty, and part of the reason why suddenly I know who's manufacturing these widgets all over the world, who's operating them, suddenly a whole ramifications of people coming into it made it very difficult. And in reality, not just are we having recommendations published now and the responses to them, many of the faults that have taken place are remedied before the thing even gets to an FEI. It's a very foolish employer that doesn't immediately, as happened, look to his practices. The other thing was time limits. I'll be very quick on this because I think there are huge problems in having mandatory time limits in FEI. For example, the bin lorry FEI. There are many questions out there about whether that went ahead too quickly. So there can be good reasons why you don't do it. You may have a, a health and safety inquiry. You may have an aviation Most inquiry. Please, please. All of these may be necessary to take place, quite frankly, before you have the FAR, even where mm -hmm. the Crown decides whether or not to go any further with a prosecution. All in all, thank you. I support this. And although the original bill is so old, doesn't necessarily mean all statutes passed its sell by date, but this one was. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Now call on John Finney. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Finney. Uh, thank you, President Officer. It's Article 2 of the uh, European Convention on Human Rights that creates a right, a right to life and with it the duty on a state to investigate the loss of life. And I know that that's a duty that this state doesn't take lightly, hasn't and won't in the future. During the course of this uh, passage of this legislation, I think there's been a number of very interesting bits of discussion, the issue of mental health being, being one. And, and I think the willingness of people to move their position on various matters throughout this bill, I certainly have been persuaded. And I, I, I think that's the nature of the scrutiny that has taken place and the willingness to engage. So I, I, I'm, I'm very pleased about that. Likewise, um, and much has been driven, and like many others, I, I, I commend Patricia Ferguson, the, the, the family charter, the milestone, I think is a, a significant... I have to say it will be a challenge for Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service if they're going to service that properly because there are, it's a very emotive thing dealing with, with any death. Now, um, the Minister talked about the history of this legislation and clearly it's an evolving situation and this will pro prove par form part of it. Um, Lord Cullen did report in 2009 some initial administrative issues are picked up but the bulk of his recommendations did require primary legislation. That's why we got here and we know that not all of his recommendations were um, uh, taken up by the Scottish Government. And indeed, the question of legal aid, I, you know, um, I, I was very happy to lend my support to that, and of course I'm disappointed about it. Um, who knows what a majority Green 
future administration will do when it comes to wielding power. Um, but it's arithmetic. It's, a with, it's arithmetic. Um, there will not be any airplanes, you're right, yes. Um, um, but a member's experience is all different. I, I have experience of an FAI from the point of view of a, a death in custody. I can tell you it was a very harrowing experience for everyone involved. Um, I was there um, ensuring that um, federated ranks were represented. They were represented by a lawyer. I have to say that uh, the findings showed no, no disregard for the welfare of the, the, the individual uh, who sadly lost his life, quite the reverse. But it was a very searching experience for everyone. And uh, it certainly is not a forum for the layperson. That's the most important thing to say. Um, so Elaine Murray's um, uh, motion on the uh, amendment at stage two on trade union and staff association, um, now refined, uh, I think is, is, is very welcome. Um, and. Uh, the, the other thing that I think uh, maybe sounds very dry but is very important too is the case management that's going to be adopted because the, the less trauma we can have associated with the process, um, I, I think the better. Um, I think allowing FEIs to be reopened and reconvened is very important. Um, I've already dealt with an inquiry from uh, a constituent uh, about a historic case and I think it's, it's clear that um, that won't apply and I think we need to get that message very clear that, that it won't cover um, um, FEIs um, covered by the 76 legislation. Um, and we know that any death is traumatic. A death where there are no remains is additionally traumatic. So many of the issues covering that with the absence of a body, I think, have been very sensitively dealt with and will be very reassuring uh, to people. I have to say, I imagine families are completely unconcerned whether something is mandatory or discretionary. What they want is answers. Um, and, and again, I come back to the family charter. That will play a very important role in that. Likewise, the deaths abroad service personnel, that's, that's to, to be welcome. There was a lot of discussion about the findings. My colleague Christine Graham touched on that there. And your initial thoughts on what can uh, and can't be achieved can often be shaped by what you hear, and there are challenges about that. But of course, if you go back to the initial purpose, it's to understand the cause and put in place um, you know, mechanisms to, repeat, to avoid a repetition. Um, that's very important. Um, Public interest is very important. Also, public reassurance is very important. And I think this legislation will play its part in providing some public reassurance, and I will certainly be supporting it at conclusion. Thank you. Many thanks. We now move to closing speeches, and I call on Annabel Goldie. Up to four minutes, please, Ms Goldie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome this um, Stage 3 debate on the inquiries into fatal accidents and sudden death Scotland Bill, and I share the tributes already paid to the Justice Committee, to Patricia Ferguson, and to the many witnesses and stakeholders who have helped to inform the legislative process. And as this bill concludes its parliamentary passage today, it's worth reflecting on what its purpose is, which is to implement the 36 recommendations of the Cullen Review, which require primary legislation some six years after these were published. That review, of course, was timely because the relevant legislation was elderly. It had not necessarily kept, a pla kept pace with other developments in the justice system, not least the incorporation of the um, European Convention of Human Rights into UK law. And the test today, presiding officer, is whether this legislation achieves the policy objective to reform and modernise the law governing the holding of fatal accident inquiries in Scotland. And my party's assessment is that it does indeed do that, and we shall support the bill at decision time. There are some very positive and noteworthy provisions, not least the requirement that sheriff's determinations should be published and that anyone who was a party to the inquiry and to whom a re recommendation is addressed should have to uh, respond accordingly. And just as the Justice Committee did at stage one, I do urge the Scottish Government to find ways of ensuring that sheriff's recommendations are um, respected. At stage two, Patricia Ferguson lodged, I think, a welcome amendment to the bill, creating a statutory obligation on the Lord Advocate to produce a family liaison charter. And it is the case that the issues surrounding the often intermittent communication of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service with bereaved families are well documented. There are no doubt numerous reasons can be adduced for such spasmodic contact, but it does exacerbate an already extremely difficult and sensitive time for relatives. So the cross-party support for that amendment, I think, was very welcome, and I join other members in acknowledging Patricia Ferguson's considerable work to reform FAIs. I was troubled by the removal from the bill of her uh, provision to ensure legal aid for families, and I I think fatal accident inquiries are an entirely different beast to civil litigation hearings, and I'm not sure that distinction was appreciated. 
Uh, can I just comment briefly on the Justice um, Committee Stage 1 report and the lack of clarity surrounding the purpose of a fatal accident inquiry which is held in the public interest? I think there's a real misunderstanding in this area and it serves to raise the expectations of families if there is not greater transparent transparency. And I think there's an obligation on all parties involved to provide that transparency. I mean, how um, does the fatal accident inquiry relate to other investigations involving fatalities and how does it relate to the role of the family or families affected? And greater transparency would help to demystify a complex system while at the same time managing the expectations of what the inquiry will ultimately achieve. Standing officer, as I conclude my remarks this afternoon, I want to turn to Margaret Mitchell's stage two amendments, which despite receiving support from all but the SNP members of the Justice Committee were removed in total from the bill today. And I noted the Minister's comments that the provisions did not attract wide support from stakeholders, although perhaps that's because the policy intent was not fully understood. But it is worth noting that Lord Cullen himself acknowledged that an FAI should be held into the deaths of those detained by the state, especially those who are most vulnerable, and that these FAIs are in the public interest. And my colleague Margaret Mitchell only sought to put that recommendation onto a statutory footing. And I think it's unfortunate that's been overturned. It has implications for our uni unicameral parliamentary system, for the robustness of scrutiny, and I think for the legitimate power and authority of a scrutinising committee by majority to change a bill. And I think air brushing such change out at stage three is unimpressive. That said, this is a good bill. It will receive the support of my party and it will have a positive impact on the system of FEIs in Scotland. Many thanks. I now call on Graham Pearson. Up to six minutes, Mr Pearson. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, first of all, can I note that the absence of rancour and largely the agreement across these benches uh, of support for the bill reflects highly on the work done by Justice Committee and Justice Committee members, uh, the contribution of Patricia Ferguson, my colleague on the back benches, uh, and those who gave evidence to the committee at stages one and two. Uh, it does well to remember that some 5,000 deaths a year are reviewed by the authorities, resulting in somewhere short of 60 being subject to fatal accident inquiry annually. Uh, the fatal accident inquiry, uh, we should remember, is designed quite properly to decide the circumstances of a death and isn't designed to apportion blame. However, as John Finney indicated, a fatal accident inquiry can be extremely difficult and very upsetting for family members, for close friends and for those who have been uh, involved with the circumstances surrounding a death. Often for the first time, they hear details which have a, a, an implication on how they might respond to the evidence they've heard. In terms of an examination of the circumstances of a death, it, it is right that the sheriff should act in a thorough and proper means to examine all the circumstances, and sometimes that can be extremely harrowing. In those circumstances, therefore, it is good to know that general agreement has been achieved in re relation to some important elements. Uh, the evidence of BMA, Sam H., uh, Mental Welfare and Commission and others have helped to point uh, this Parliament in a direction that would ensure that not in all circumstances will a fatal accident inquiry be held where a death occurs uh, involving someone facing mental health uh, conditions. Uh, the opportunity for the Crown to intervene in the appropriate circumstances to decide a fatal accident inquiry, I think is appropriate. It's commensurate with the, the circumstances that we face annually. And I've got to say, I have confidence based on experience that Procurator Fiscal Service have the ability to make the appropriate decisions in, in most circumstances. Uh, the amendments proposed by Elaine Murray uh, I think provided value to the discussion in ventilating all the issues and I'm happy to see that at the end of that process uh, we have come to a decision that I certainly feel comfortable with. Uh, secondly, the agreement of the government to include representation from trade union and staff association represent representatives 
in relevant deaths whilst engaged in employment, I think is a very helpful way forward too in advising how we should deal with them. And the third element that I think has been important today is establishing grounds where the investigation of deaths of citizens that occur abroad has been a subject area that has caused a great deal of upset for many families in Scotland to date. And to see some form of solution going forward, I think, is important and should give comfort to many relatives uh, moving forward. Uh, I am disappointed that Patricia Ferguson's amendment uh, number one, an attempt to provide some kind of equality of representation, has been rejected. Uh, it's been fully ventilated. Uh, I don't intend to go into the circumstances again, but I've certainly been present when Procurator Fiscals have made it clear to families they are there to represent uh, the public interest and not the family's concern. And families have found that very difficult to, to understand. And I would implore the Minister to ensure that the Family Liaison Charter uh, is seen as a very valuable guidance to the fiscal service in future in order that the culture of the fiscal service could take on board the changes in the responsibilities that we expect of them in the future in dealing with fatal accident inquiries. Uh, the Minister's reference during the debate to the situation in England and Wales in relation to the coroners and coroners' duties, I don't think assisted the debate today. I think it was largely irrelevant in that the system in Scotland has always been different and has always been a more positive experience for families. We should invest in those circumstances rather than relying on the comfort that it's worse elsewhere. Uh, I, I don't think I'm particularly interested in, in how it is dealt with in other jurisdictions unless it advises us in ways of improving our own. Um, and returning to the circumstances uh, of Patricia Ferguson's uh, amendments, I hope the government will bear that in mind going forward. And if experience tells us that we've gone in the wrong direction, we make an earlier change to the way forward uh, as we find from those relatives who meet the new circumstances, if they are challenged, and I suspect they will be challenged, that uh, legal aid should become a norm. In my final uh, comments in that regard, I would suggest that the presence of lawyers at fatal accident inquiries do not necessarily mean that the introduction of new conflicts. If the circumstances of, of a fatal accident inquiry is made clear to lawyers that they are there to determine the facts and not to engage in legal exchange, then I'm sure we could find a more productive way of going forward in terms of the nature of a fatal accident inquiry and the purpose for its holding. Uh, but in conclusion, uh, I make it clear we do support the principles behind the bill. We will be voting in support of the bill, and I'm grateful to the Minister personally for his approach in dealing with many of the questions and exchanges that have occurred during stages one to three. I'm obliged. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Mr. Peelhouse. Uh, uh, Mr. Pearce, I now call Paul Peelhouse to end up the debate. Uh, Mr. Peelhouse, I can give you eight minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I would like to accord my thanks to members for their contributions to this debate. Uh, I, ju I just want, before I, I indulge in going through the detail, just respond to one point which I think is important to address at the beginning. Graham Pearson raised it uh, in relation to the, many, um, the, 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 the procurator fiscal being able to point people towards legal aid. That's something I will, I will take forward and see what we can do with both the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service and indeed Legal Aid Board to make sure that people are aware of their, the, the options available to them if they feel that the Procurator Fiscal is not going to uh, take forward the line of questioning. I, I hope I, I did try and reassure members that we, we were aware of this issue, but I will take forward that point and see if there's something we can do in the Family Liaison Charter to make that more explicit. But the Bill provides the legislative framework needed to implement Lord Cullen's recommendations, while the, the detail of procedure, of course, will be provided in comprehensive bespoke rules, which are written purely for fatal accident inquiries, rather than such inquiries have to, having to rely on the ordinary cause rules in the Sheriff Court, which has been the case until now. 
Um, I want to delay, uh, there's, a, there's a point in relation to, um, Dr Murray raised the point in, about the delay in bringing forward the government bill, or perceived delay, I should say, stress, um, that the FEAI bill had uh, inevitably to wait in a queue of civil reforms, including the Court Reform um, uh, Scotland Act 2014, and was not you know, being delayed until such time as Patricia Ferguson. I think it's a happy coincidence, perhaps, um, if I can put it that way, but uh, we certainly were glad to work very closely with Patricia Ferguson. I appreciate the very hard work that she put into her bill, and uh, I appreciate the constructive approach she took thereafter, having withdrawn her bill to work with the government on, on amendments. The bill builds on Lord Cullen's recommendations, of course, which were directed to the Crown Office and which have already been implemented by the establishment of the Scottish Fatal Acts, uh, Fatalities Investigation Unit, which now oversees death investigations in Scotland. The Crown Office has also made a major contribution to the reforms we're bringing forward the, the Family Liaison Charter, which, as a result of Patricia Ferguson's amendment, will go on a statutory footing, which the Solicitor General announced when she gave evidence to the Justice Committee at Stage 1. The Charter will provide clarity regarding what information the bereaved family will be provided with at the different stages of a death investigation, and that's why I feel it's possible perhaps to foresee information about legal aid being slotted in there, and how and when that information will be communicated to them by the Crown Office, giving the choice to the bereaved families as well as to how they want to communicate with the Crown, which is important as well. And I'd like to thank the Crown Office for their expedited work on this, which included a public consultation on a draft charter over the summer in time for Stage 2. And as a consequence of an amendment, as I say, this is now on a statutory footing. It is entirely appropriate that the Crown Office should take the lead in such matters, given the position of the Lord Advocate as the independent head of the system of death investigation in Scotland. And it's worth remembering that section 40, uh, 48, subsection 5 of the Scotland Act 1998 makes it clear that, and I quote, any decision of the Lord Advocate in his capacity of head of the systems of criminal prosecution and investigation of deaths in Scotland shall continue to be taken by him independently of any other person, unquote. It's important to note how fatal accident inquiries fit into other investigations of death in Scotland. As has been said previously, procurators fiscal have a common law duty to investigate all sudden, suspicious, accidental and unexplained deaths to establish the circumstances and cause of death. And 11,000 deaths are reported to Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service each year, and they investigate about half of those. Some cases are also investigated by other agencies, including the Health and Safety Executive, and that was a point referred to by Christine Graham, the uh, Air, Ax Air Marine and Rail Accident Investigation Branches, the Care Inspectorate, and of course, the Mental Welfare Commission. And this sometimes does cause a delay in the commencement of a fatal accident inquiry, um, but these are all very important uh, investigations themselves. The Crown Office engages with these agencies and may instruct the police to investigate the circumstances and consider whether criminal charges should be brought which lead to a prosecution. Consideration of criminal proceedings take primacy, but very often investigations by the Crown are held up and delayed by investigations by, for example, the Air Accident Investigation Branch, and members will be aware there was considerable delay before the AAIB produced its report into the Clutha tragedy in Glasgow. These delays are a matter of regret as they lengthen the period of time before any fatal accident inquiry can take place. Um, I want to turn to some of the points that have been raised in debate. Um, a number of members, Christine uh, Graham, Christian Allard, uh, Graham Pearson, John Finney, all referred to the issue of deaths abroad being covered by the, the new bill. The Justice Committee queried the requirement for the repatriation of a body for an inquiry into the death of a Scot who died abroad. And I agreed that there, are many, uh, there may be occasions when a body may have been lost or is otherwise not available for examination or post-mortem. I want to pay particular tribute, though, to uh, Mr and Mrs Beveridge, who gave evidence to the Justice Committee at Stage 1. It was a very brave thing to do. Um, clearly, the death of their son, Blair Jordan, in very harrowing circumstances, um, was, was extremely distressing for them to deal with. I'm very grateful, as I'm sure members of the Justice Committee were, for them coming in to give their personal experience. I hope today they take some satisfaction, although it will not benefit their own family, uh, because it would require a retrospective um, fatal accident inquiry that will give them the confidence that if any situation arose that was similar to the situation that Blair went through, um, that an, a mandatory uh, fatal accident, or sorry, the, the, the Lord Advocate would have discretion to hold a fatal accident inquiry and, uh, and also in the circumstances when the body may be lost at sea as well would be covered. It's right that in such exceptional circumstances, the possibility of a death investigation and potentially an FEI into death abroad should not be lost. And, and for this reason, uh, we proposed uh, uh, the amendment that the uh, stage two to remove the requirement for the repatriation of a body. And this will indeed uh, hopefully help relatives. The government recognises also the need for brief families to be kept informed of progress with death investigations. And we believe the Crown Office's charter will provide reassurance 
and enhance public confidence in the system. The Charter will provide uh, information about the system and timescales time to families and will be written in a way that is understandable and accessible to everyone. And I hope that in some way goes towards dealing with the concern that Patricia Ferguson had underlying her bill about the timescales to ensure that these families are aware of what to expect so there's no nasty surprises in terms of delays that are encountered and they're kept informed all the way through about the likelihood of a criminal prosecution. Of course. Just, just before you run out of time, I want to know the answer to my question, which was the death of service personnel in Scotland for whom mandatory FAIs were not available. You're coming to it. Excellent. I'll sit down. Thank you, uh, to, to Ms Graham. Um, I will pick that point up. In terms of the military FEIs being retrospective, the answer is, is no. A discretionary inquiry will have been considered at the time of, of the incident. However, in future, I hope uh, from the armed forces community and their families, they will take confidence in the fact that if such a, an event was ever to happen again, it will now be mandatory to have a fatal accident inquiry into the death of service personnel in Scotland. Um, Alison McInnes uh, referred to the child death review and I look forward to, to hearing about the outcome just to, to inform the member that uh, the child death review steering group has submitted its report to Scottish ministers and is, uh, this is currently being considered by the Scottish Government so I hope it's not too long before uh, that is uh, made available. To sum up, the bill will ensure that FEIs remain fact-finding inquisitorial judicial hearings held in the public interest to establish the circumstances of sudden, suspicious or unexplained deaths or those whose circumstances cause public concern. FEIs are not meant to hold people to account, as the media occasionally mistakenly suggests, nor are they specifically to provide answers for bereaved families, though they will normally do so. Questions of blame or guilt are for civil or criminal proceedings. FEIs are held in the public interest to establish the cause of death and to permit the sheriff to make recommendations as to how deaths in similar circumstances may be avoided in future. The bill also ensures that the system will be in keeping with other justice reforms, including the use of specialist and summary sheriffs, preliminary hearings, the early agreement of uncontroversial facts and greater scope for the location and accommodation of FEIs. When taken together with the Section 104 order and the new FEI rules, which will be brought forward by the Scottish Civil Justice Council next year, the bill will represent a significant modernisation and reform of the law on fatal accident inquiries. Presiding officer, I commend this bill to Parliament. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate on the inquiries into fatal accidents and sudden deaths, etc. Scotland Bill. On a point of order, Neil Findlay. President, officer, I wonder if you can help. Um, we have been notified today that the uh, LCM that was uh, put down in relation to the trade union bill has been rejected by the parliamentary clerks and yourself. Um, clearly, there is a will in this parliament, across this parliament, to reject the trade union bill and uh, the fact that it does have an impact on the, what the functions of government are, particularly in relation to things like payroll deductions, facility time and a whole range of features within that bill that are clearly the preserve of the Scottish Government. So I'm asking you, uh, as presiding officer, how we can get that bill, uh, that LCM before this parliament, or an LCM before this parliament, because we have that cross uh, parliament support, with one or two exceptions, to reject this bill. It's only the rules of this parliament and the standing orders of this parliament that are stopping that from happening. Therefore, this parliament should be able to change that to ensure that we can reject this bill. I'm looking for your ruling. Thank you for your point of order, uh, Mr Findlay. Can I say uh, that it was my decision that it is not a relevant bill and therefore no LCM can be tabled. There are other ways that the Parliament has if they wish to uh, discuss the matter and I'm sure that the Government and any other interested parties will take those discussions forward. But there is no possibility of an LCM being lodged in the Parliament because it is not a relevant bill. We now move to decision time. Is this a further point of order, Ms Ferguson? I'd be very grateful for your clarification, presiding officer, as to why it is not appropriate bill. If it's merely a matter for the standing orders of this parliament, would it not be possible to ask the Standards and Procedures and Appointments Committee to consider a change to standing orders to allow that bill to be taken? It is, I have already set out all of my reasons um, in my letter to the Cabinet Secretary. Um, any member can have a look at that. I have asked for it to be lodged in SPICE. Um, it is not simply a matter of standing orders. And on that point, I am now moving on to decision time. 
Is this a further point of order, or is it um, the same point of order? To a letter that many members haven't seen. Therefore, um, I think it, it is only right that members see that, and so that we can decide how we take this matter forward. And I wonder when you will provide that letter to all members of this party. Mr Finlay, I'm sure when you leave here tonight, you can go down to Spice, where the letter has been there since before two o'clock this afternoon and is available to every member. We now move to decision time. The question is that motion number 15113, in the name of Paul Peelhouse, on the inquiries into fatal accidents and sudden deaths, etc., on Scotland Bill, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to, and the inquiries into fatal accidents and sudden death, etc., Scotland Bill is passed. That concludes decision time. I now close this meeting.